good evening to all the viewers who are watching live and will be watching as a recorded version and i welcome you all to this very new cme in this 35th cme so without wasting any more time and without losing any more patience uh, so let's start our today's cme and first of all let me tell you we have two winners you may or may not see them over here but let me announce the name the first winner is shoaib ahmed shoaib ahmed from midnapur homeopathic medical college and hospital a medico and the second winner of the quiz competition is uh, raina datto medico second year second year from mahesh bhattacharya homeopathic medical college and hospital so that's it and i will see you at the end of the the cme video cme video or the live stream so let's start Good evening, sir. Good evening, good everybody. Evening. Very, very good evening. Shubho Vijay Pranam. Our love and affection from NIH Alumni Association to all the viewers. Our respect to all the seniors, our teachers, our beloved uh, fellow uh, faculty members of NIH, and all the other homeopathic institutions and medical institutions across the globe. And. Uh, uh in bengali it said pai pai poitirish so starting from a little step one year uh, before we are on the 35th cme online live and today we before starting of the cme i with the permission of kalyani sir uh, i like to make a very very important announcement and a, a brief information to all of uh, the alumni of nih as well as uh, the current students or the other uh, doctors of nih and of homeopathy now, sir may i sure sure uh, we are uh, very uh, fortunate and we are very uh, proud to have our united family of alumni or alumni of national institute of homeopathy just few days back two of first year first bhms batch alumni and one second bhms batch alumni had been to tripura for their family vacation in a distant part of tripura and uh, this alumni were your beloved pralay sir his wife jumu ma'am and dr partha chakravarti and his family they went to udaipur over there our beloved jhumur faced with severe hemorrhagic shock due to certain medical conditions which went in a very deteriorating condition and thanks god because of the immediate intervention of almost all the alumni present in and around that place of udaipur i don't want to mention the names as the person the gentleman who had organized everything he today evening told dada please don't mention us but it's the thing which we learned from all of you seniors and our beloved teachers to be by the side of everybody in times of need this family and the extended nh family they collected together arranged for the blood arranged immediate operation jumur was admitted in icu and for the current information c is out of danger back in our beloved alumnus who had laid all this thing with the other beloved alumni of tripura from national stop homeopathy they all came together and kept updated of any required medical or other help at any point of time so 
we are saluting all our alumni who are in the times of need who came over there by the side of proloy and patra and their family in times of need we on behalf of nh alumni association kalani sir myself vidyut we all are saluting you again and it's a real okay, encouragement it's a real encouragement it's a real open hearted love affection what you had showed at the times of need during this uh, pandemic uh, orientation and uh, so that's all for the basic announcement which is uh, something a bit unprecedented now i'd like to request i like to introduce you today's inaugurator dr shurojit sharkar dr shurojit sharkar is a very devoted homeopath he is from nih second batch of bhms and he is a very successful doctor in nadia district of west bengal i request our backstage editor to bring today's inaugurator dr shurojit sharkar to inaugurate and introduce the speakers the topic and the moderators of tonight over to you shurojit thank you vidyuta thank you everybody namaskar sir good evening i am dr shurojit sarkar second year nis proud myself as an alumnus of nis alumni association many thanks of our association for selecting me as the introducer of 35 cme on behalf of this association today i am going to introduce two speaker dr tikankar banerji the assistant director of banerji healthcare coming to share his experience mass cultivated subject of covid 19 dr banerji is going to deliver piece about revisiting my experience test protocol for treatment of covid 19 with homeopathy a proposed therapeutic guideline it is known to us covid 19 was about to devour the whole world on the deadly symptom of covid 19 is pneumonia our second speaker dr supriya de junior research fellow under the dengue preventive study project at dsc rri ccrs kolkata medical officer rbsk navogram dpsc murshidabad would speak volume for respiratory illness and its homeopathic management today night we have dr respected dr ashok kumar konar professor department of medicine and medica metropolitan homeopathic medical college and hospital is our moderator now i would earnestly request dr tikankar banerji to make his precious speech on thank you thank you shurojit thank you very much and uh, uh, kalani sir uh, before we start with uh, dr tithankar uh, can we uh, call on our professor uh, konar uh, to sure. hand over the dais to uh, konar sir sure sure uh, also please uh, bring on Orko. professor ashok konar sir yes uh, welcome welcome ashok sir and yes. good evening good evening good evening to all i am very proud of uh, myself that you have called me you have uh, in this uh, cme pro 35th uh, cme program i am really proud uh, as because ex dipnage and 13th batch or last batch of dipnage uh, so i hope the nice product is very nice those will speakers dr tikthankar and dr uh, supriyo uh, both of i know them i hope so they will deliver their lecture and their cme programs for the topics of that uh, they will deliver very nicely so here is our respected um, uh, our alumni president 
Dr. Dan Kolani. I know the very well. Uh, I should not say anything more because I have the relation 1981 and I respect him. I regard him. Uh, my, uh, what should I say about money? He's the very uh, good money. We have lost the he, but uh, he is not our directly teacher, but he is the our respected teacher. I uh, myself. I'm always respect and I'm proud of him. So Dr. Kolani and Dr. Bidduth, uh, both you are very nicely, you have organized this alumni association and aluminum I have seen and I have heard the alumni association is going to organize very nicely. And I hope so alumni association in future, it will be great, proud, from a night. Thank you, Dr. Bidduth. Dr. Bidduth. Thank you, sir. Should, should and, I say uh, more? anything more? Okay. No, no, thank sir, you. Now, thank now you. stage is yours, sir. And you will call on uh, Dr. Uh, Tithankar. Tithankar, oh, please okay. start. Achha. Okay, okay. Dr. Tithankar, you can start your uh, topics. Mm -hmm. And yes, I hope so. It will be uh, you, Thank good. You. Thank you, sir. Thank deliver you so your lecture very nicely. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, should I start now? Pitanga, please start. Okay, sir. You are sure. live. Um, hello, everyone. And thank you so much, my respected seniors, everybody who is present before me right now. I would like to first thank you all for giving me this opportunity to share my clinical experience, especially during the first and second phase of COVID-19. We have witnessed a worldwide catastrophe with this particularly newcome epidemic. So here it goes, myself, Dr. Tirthankar Banerjee, and I am Assistant Director of Banerjee's Healthcare, sharing my and revisiting my experience-based protocol for treatment of COVID-19 with homeopathy. It's a proposed therapeutic guideline. And before I directly go into this seminar, I would like to dedicate these presentations to those patients who not only believed in us, but also in homeopathy during the most devastating COVID crisis of their lives. And my parents, my sister, and my respected teachers, my colleagues, and my fellow juniors for their persistent psychological and moral support during the entire COVID-19 period, we had the war on. Finally, this presentation is dedicated to late Dr. Omar Kumar Banerjee, who was a physician of modern medicine, but an ardent supporter of homeopathy, a chevalier of COVID I ever met. Before going directly into the topic, I'd like to share a brief introduction that COVID-19 has become a major health concern in recent times for the community as well. We are yet to achieve a standard therapeutic model for COVID-19 because of its absolute new nature in the civilization and we have got also limited resource to study, correlate and research of its true nature, clinical course and what might be the consequences therefore. These presentations represent my only personal experience with homeopathy in treatment of COVID-19, not only in first wave, specifically during the second wave. So as we all know that it's a viral pandemic that hit India in January 
2020, where the index cases were from Kerala, we have witnessed two Sarkisi waves up to recent times. As you can recall the past, the March 2020, India invokes the Epidemic Disease Act as well as the Disaster Management Act in the form of suspension lockdowns to minimize the disastrous consequence of the pandemic. The lockdown of first wave and the second wave we have all faced. Not only it was only a health concern, the COVID has also resulted in loss of dailies as paramount disease burden emerges and witnessed gross stalling of economy, social, as well as educational life. So it's kind of a mandatory discussion that before we go in to understand what is COVID-19, how we can approach it homeopathically, how I did an approach to this new come epidemic, pretty much unknown and less known condition. So let us have a brief look out to the virology. COVID-19 is caused by a coronavirus. The electron microscope, the virion capsid resemblance solar corona, hence the name was coronavirus was given. Coronavirus is not something new to the civilization. Coronavirus was known for a long time because it is pathogenic to mice, cattle, and birds. In humans, the clinical spectrum, it results in a sickness forming a large prolonged clinical spectrum from common flu to severe acute respiratory distress syndrome. This category of virus has created mess like SARS, MARS, and COVID-19 recently. The capsule is medically significant as it harbors a protein known as spike protein. For short, we can call it as S protein. This protein, when it enters into the body through the respiratory system, binding with the target cell membrane antigens, that in turn recognize the activation of angiotensin converting enzyme pathway, which is responsible for many of its clinical outcome. This is very important to know all these mechanisms of how a pathology develops in COVID-19 to understand the clinical syndrome of COVID-19 before we start use, before we wage a war against it. The typical clinical spectrum falls under various categories and it's really variable. It falls under a large clinical spectrum ranging from a simple common cold, influenza-like illness or ILI to a more lethal acute respiratory distress syndrome, SARS, and cytokine release syndrome from immunohistological dysregulation. As per my clinical experience goes, in South Kolkata, mild to moderate cases has been treated by physicians of all disciplines in the form of teleconsultations, public health programs, social media, and in outdoors clinical setup, which has reduced the healthcare burden on more intensive care units. What happened, all this data we have gathered formed, helped the homeopath to form a genus epidemicus, certain developed device, certain treatment protocols. In homeopathy, government aided selection of Arsenicum album 30 c which was also prescribed in form of an immuno booster prior to the wave of COVID-19 pan-India. This is, this is an absolutely observational review. What we have seen in first wave and what we have seen in second wave. The basic, even though the basic clinical outcome remains the same, the clinical picture literally changed drastically during the second wave. So let us see what we observed in the first wave afflictions. The cases oscillated toward upper respiratory involvement initially, sore throat and laryngeal irritation, chorizal symptoms, anosmia and hypochusia. That's a lack of taste. Obstinate dry, sometimes wet cough. Some cases, however, went on progression towards atypical viral pneumonitis. Secondary infections in the lung. However, few cases shows profuse expectoration. There was a CT score, close correlation of CT score and NLR, that is neutrophil to leukocyte ratio, and independent biomarker with disease severity. Affection is mostly of old, frail persons. What happened in the second wave? The second wave situation was pretty worse. The cases mostly involving lower respiratory tract, 
and there was a rapid progression of the disease. Due to above mentioned point, increased symptom prominence of dyspnea, a rapid progression to SARS, bizarre alarming and rapid failure of alveolar ventilation resulting in type 1 failure. Affection is more toward healthy, fit, immunoreactive young adults. That was a very dangerous situation that in the previous, the old people were getting more affected. But in the second wave, what we have seen that even the young people, 30, 35, 25, 26 years, healthy persons are getting affected. High chance of immunohematological consequences. This is what we have also seen. Prominent post-COVID syndrome, including brain fogging. What was the problem we faced initially during the treatment? During the first wave, as due to our very limited understanding of the pathology, of the symptomatology, we sought help from symptomatic picture from a very foggy, less known clinical picture. However, when the cases increased and patients started coming to homeopaths, we also formed a clearer picture, even from a small single geographical location, the disease picture, pic picture became clearer in second wave. Due to multiple mutants of this virus, as we have seen in newspapers, in recent journals, the virus likely has resulted drastic change of clinical picture in Sarkisi waves. The alpha, the beta, and was responsible for two waves in India when the Delta mutant were also isolated in some places. The mutants are responsible for rapidly changing pattern, also the character of affection, the character of clinical syndrome, the character of outcomes and so on, also really modified the way of COVID-19 tracking, treatment, prognosis and outcomes. So as a physician, we must first monitor all the possible prognostic factors in every case in hand. So what I did, I devised a, a stepwise way to do this one. Usually the patient consulting his or her PCP means primary care physician for the first time with fever, coryzal symptom, many patients showed signs of loss of smell and taste. During this, we inquired about more alarming symptoms of abdominal cramps, dysentery, diarrhea, dyspnea, so on. So at this point, our RT-PCR, reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction was ordered, as well as homeopathic medications were given and then strict isolation as per COVID-19 protocol were advised. So in the second phase, many patients recovered with this. In the second phase, if the condition goes bad, we must do some basic monitoring of parameters and close monitoring of symptoms. At this point, if the patient is, in, is going not towards recovery, but if we fail, if we couldn't halt the process of this, then we must resort to SPO2 monitoring, routine blood examinations, X-ray of chest, NLR, and HRCT if required. If the condition goes graver. Mostly it may so happen that the patients are coming to us directly at this stage in the second or in the third stage where the patient's attendants must be counseled about the condition. The referral system must be kept very clear and very good because the patient might need supportive care. Scrutiny for immunohematological dysregulation must be done as it is very common with SARS group of viruses that this virus will trigger cytokine release syndrome and might result in a worsening CT score and falling SpO2. Early aggressive scrutiny, early, uh, early referral might be required. At these conditions, monitoring of certain parameters are very, very important, which I shall be sharing with you all soon. So it, it is often seen that in normal outdoor or clinic setting, it's pretty tough to go for in extensive investigations, aggressive interventions. But here we can do with small steps that might lead to save a life from a disastrous COVID event. We are often faced with scarcity of diagnostic and imaging modalities 
even in urban clinic setups. And often a brief clinical classification of the COVID-19 sufferer help in early intervention with homeopathy, management, evaluation of scope and limitations and a timely referral when required. So here it goes as follows. So here the classification of COVID patient is entirely based on clinical and very few diagnostic imaging, diagnostic modalities, which might come in really handy when we are dealing with a COVID patient. The mild, moderate and severe cases. In mild cases, we got simple sort of upper respiratory tract involvement, sneezing, chorizal signs, but there is no sign of pneumonia in a plain chest X-ray. Moderate cases, presents with all of the mild category, but in plain chest X-ray, 50% more than lung involvement. And uh, at this time, we need to measure the SpO2 and the SpO2 is expected to be more than 93. The severe clinical classic category of COVID patients are having all the previous symptoms. Along with that, more than 50% of lung involvement in a plain CT scan. And these patients are really in a critical situation of less than, less than 93% of their SpO2, signs of showing signs of coagulopathy and CRS, that is cytokine release syndrome. So before starting with homeopathic interventions, we must remember that there are certain worthy points which I personally have followed while seeing a patient of diagnosed COVID-19 in our clinics. That is, we must maintain the desired oxygen saturation. That is 92 to 96. And for COPT patients, which is very common in all over India, the desired level should be 82 to 92. In any part of the treatment, we must have this kind, this range to be borne in mind. Immunohematological parameters must be monitored before we can halt, we can arrest the progression to a grave CRS. And that is regular monitoring of early diagnosis of life-threatening coagulopathy, DIC, pulmonary and DVT, pulmonary thrombosis and DVT. Reducing as much as possible silent lung damage and reducing fever and provide comfort. Psychological support for a COVID patient is very, very much needed. Most of the patients are very much afraid, especially during when they got diagnosed with COVID, when they are doing treatment for COVID and, and often they get cured, but they suffer from long COVID syndrome. This long COVID syndrome is a very troublesome, very difficult to understand psychological and neuropsychiatry phenomena, which often leads to something known as brain fogging, confusion, lack of cognitive behavior, so on. So let us now go to the red dots. A homeopathic physician must remember while dealing with COVID patients, which I have personally took help, help of. The primary motto of a homeopathic physician not only to reduce the fever and, and manage COVID pneumonia, but also to reduce the chance of coagulation disorders and earliest detection of lethal complications. All the red dots are must remember for a physician to be vigilant as well as fluent, not only with Metro Medica, but also interpreting the recent diagnosis and prognostic checkups for COVID. It may not be always possible to do a panel of tests difficult to difficult investigations but we can do very basics and try to arrest the process very beautifully it is to be remembered that the lethal consequences of covid not only resides in lung but also is systematic it may so happen that uh, a patient we have got patients who have been treated by by anyone and then these patients are having severe post covid lung syndrome post covid brain fag, etc., just as I have mentioned in my previous slide. So this is a collected picture of, as we can see here, there are certain opacities. We can see there are, there are particular halos. In the next slide, we'll be, we'll, be, um, we'll be showing you that. This is a CT scan picture. This is a CT scan of the thorax, showing HRCT thorax, showing patchy opacities and consolidations of the lung 
which have been given arrows. So it's it's very important that uh, there will be bilateral, lobular, as well as segmental areas of consolidation, ground glass opacities. Lung involvement correlates well with total CT score. A raised CT score is found with existing airway pathologies, presence of a pleural effusion, nodules, actual involvement, peribronchovascular prominent disease. So there is one important type of halo we can see that's the reverse halo opacity. And the reverse halo opacity, along with that, there might be a crazy paving opacities can be found. These are very important radiological finding. Before going into that, we must understand that what happens when the virus triggers a severe immune response. When the virus is affecting and creating a destruction of the lungs, this virus leads to, as well as the human body reacts, and that reaction creates a widespread systemic septic response, a systemic immunohematological response. The coronavirus creates widespread lung damage from viral pneumonia. A widespread dysregulated systemic immune response results in release of huge amount of inflammatory mediators causing cytokine release syndrome. It's worth it to remember that vitamin B3, nicotinamide, and magnesium reduces the chance of development of CRS. This is a very important point. We must understand that a cytokine release syndrome in COVID-19, what happens? This is what I tried to make a complicated thing, a super simple one. So a viral sepsis in lung activating immune response. So sequential organ damage from mass release of inflammatory mediators as because the body reacts pretty aggressively. And this distributed host immune response creates a sepsis, acute heart injury, that's COVID-mediated carditis, cardiomyopathy, resulting in COVID-mediated heart failure. Hematological dysregulation leads to DIC and venous arterial thrombosis, pulmonary thromboembolism. We must be very vigilant with the patient coming to us at any stage. So here for our own health, we made a short list of what are the points to be checked. This list is not complete, as I must say. And, and in this short span, it's, it's hard for me to explain all the parameters, but I tried to give a very brief outline of what are the parameters we need to look for is apart from our normal X-ray and the non-TPCR. We must resort, we must sort help from seeing C-reactive protein. C-reactive protein is a damage of systemic inflammatory response syndrome and also correlates with the extent of lung damage. The leukocytosis, as we know, that is an indicator of systemic sepsis. Procalcitonin. Procalcitonin is a marker of cytokine release syndrome and systemic sepsis. Procalcitonin can be done very easily in anywhere around the country. Neutrophil to leukocyte ratio that NLR, it's very, very important, independent biomarker for monitoring disease severity. Absolute lymphocyte count. LDH is another very important point that's lactate dehydrogenase. That's a, it's a, got a huge prognostic value. It monitors how the disease is progressing. It may so happen that the clinical syndrome and the pathology often go unlooked for. So these are important parameters we must Remember, that's creatinine kinase level. Again, this sometimes in rare of the rarest situation events, this sepsis or systemic inflammatory response syndrome might lead to destruction of muscle proteins, that's rhabdomyolysis. And this rhabdomyolysis is, whether there is rhabdomyolysis is taking place or not, can be done by creatinine kinase level. We must remember that a raised CK level is, up, is a, Predicing a uh, warning sign for development of renal injury because this protein might lead to acute renal failure. 
D-dimers are a good marker for dissimilarity intervascular coagulation, prothrombin time, and activated partial thromboplastin time are also good markers for coagulopathy. So these are the important parameters apart from our X-ray, CT scan of the chest, etc. All these are these are very very important prognostic factors. We must bone in our mind. We often have to do. We often have to check them periodically in 48 to 72 hours gap for assessment of the disease progression selectively. Not it might not be needed for every every case in hand. But for majority of the cases in, hand, cases in hand, it might be needed that monitoring of all these parameters two or three times. So let us enter directly to the experience-based, what I learned during my, uh, my way of treating COVID, what I learned. So I, this classically, characterized these patients into three or four categories. Usually in the very beginning, we get cases of acute upper respiratory tract involvement with or without fever. Acute sinusoidal congestion, coriza with sneezing, signs of anosmia and signs of agusia or hypogeusia. So at this stage, a confirmation of diagnosis is very, very important because loss of smell and taste might occur with a lot many conditions. We must remember that the loss of smell absolute loss of smell may be a very good indication for Kalman syndrome, but we are not going to that. We will be understanding here that we must confirm the diagnosis of COVID. So the history of exposure, a travel history and positive RT-PCR is important. At this patient, many patients go, at this stage, many patients are asymptomatic. A routine chest X-ray shows no or minimal lung involvement. In the second category, we start with drugs mostly intended for treatment of acute coriza. Most probably exciting cause with the change, exposure to heat, drops of cold, combined coriza complaints, the particular coriza symptom of a drug along with the modalities and a few. I have written three constitutional symptoms here. Example, so there will be if there is a constant urge to sneeze with a thin, very excoriating discharge, more sneezing, more aggravation of sneezing and a burning sensation a constitution, a tubercular constitution with lean thin and profound weakness, a ravenous appetite, better by cold, we can get help from arsenicum iot. So here in stage one, we have given a probable list of drugs. The list of probable drugs in very early of COVID, especially in 200 C potency, with twice a, twice a day or thrice a day repetition, leads to termination of the entire sequence. If we can give these drugs based upon the current symptomatology as well as the patient's constitution forming an apparent totality of symptoms and can prescribe this drug, we can absolutely at the very beginning, we can stop this entire disease process. They are nitromuriticum, nitromarsenicum, magnum, dalcamar, gelsemium, arsenicum iod, bryony alba, ferrum phosphoricum, Rostoxicodendron and influenzinum. However, during this time, even with the dynamic drug acting, especially in aged or hypochondriac patients, I sought help of certain drugs in lower dilutions. They are Eucalyptus globulus, Lufa operculata, Limna minor, Justitia datoda, Sinapis niagara, Sticta pulmonaria, Sabadilla, Rosa damsiana, and Aram draconitia. Now, let us move to the category two patients. It's a very important here from the, the disease progression really appears and it creates a really worrying sign for the doctors. The patients not responding to previous treatment or those patients who are coming to us at this stage. It's a very important one. Patients are coming to us with this stage and there is treatment is fever and signs of disease progression. Here, the patient is hypothyroidic and showing signs of lung involvement, maybe significant lung involvement when the patient is coming to us. If we see that the patient is recovered with those previous, previous management, we can conclude the treatment with a suitable antimyosmetic like sorinum, 
calcarea, phosphor calcarea phosphorical. Anna Fischnellis, Veritrum species, Veritrum album, as well as Veritrum vinidi, Arnica montana, Arsenica album, Nitramu, Sulfur, Calcarea sulf, Influenzinum and Oscillococcinum, Rustox, Nux vomica, and Heloderma. For the lower dilutions, might, need it, might be needed at times, they are Antifebrinum, Atista indica, Nycdanthus, Eucalyptus globulus, Atodriacta indica, Epitorium parfoliata, Ferrum phosphoricum, and Cancia ligua. Moving on to my next slide. Now, this is another one. We have, we have seen that these patients are category 3 patients. This is absolutely a categorization I made for my own patient assessment, which I think I am sharing with you all with the hope that it might help you in help everybody. Patient coming with highly progressed disease, referral from other system of medicine, non-responsive to previous interventions. There will be a group of people who might have come at this stage to us and showing a significant sign of lung damage and showing grade two level CT abnormality, moderate disease, SPO2, however, has to be maintained as I have told 92 to 96 and for COPD 82 to 88 to 92 it might go even lower than that. Patient might show fever, dyspnea and signs of hematological abnormalities. Here what I have found at this stage with my limited experience I have found that certain way of finding symptoms where can we find the symptoms at this stage the patients are often unconscious. The patient is often highly pyrexic, giving a, giving a fever rate of 100 to 103 degree Fahrenheit. Pretty much impossible for them to give us any clear clinical import indications for the selection of the drugs. So we have, I, help, I took help of signs and observations of the patient's attendant and as directed by our master handman. So we have done this one that we have in cases of fever, we have made, we used to make a chart of the fever, the showing the time of the pyrexia. What is the time the, the fever is coming? Just like two peaks or three peaks or four peaks a day. It's a very, very important point which can help us to understand what is the modality of the drug that can get fit into. Relationship with perspiration, a very, very important point that we have seen there is a relationship of perspiration with this remedy. Next is that relationship of thirst, the sweat, whether the sweat is hot and cold. Perspiration relationship, I can share a case of Sambucus nigra and conium. I have shared in later slides. Relationship with dyspnea, as we all know, the particular time when the dyspnea patient develops the dyspnea, most of the patients develops dyspnea like of a spongia, arsenicum album character in the midnight. Some patients develop, develop dyspnea like a hypersulfurous time, modalities of dyspnea. Apprehensiveness, restlessness, stupor, or sleepiness. Another very, very important point if found in proper degree, if found in clinical indication, might lead to prescription of this prescription of drugs based on these points, that the patient is very apprehensive, the patient might be very restless or in a stuporous condition or very, very sleepiness ensures or absolutely, absolutely sleepless. Pattern of rising and fever subsiding. Just as I have told you, the patient is asked not to take any other medications to reduce the fever and to take a 24 hour or 48 hour fever chart. It's a very, very good prescription clue for treatment of this kind of fevers. Physical appearance, where the clues can be found to prescribe the drug are the tongue. Very importantly, we have seen the tongues of Bacticia, Veritron, Viridi, and Epis. Accompanying complaints, 
the disproportionate tachycardia of pyrogenium, the irregular pulse of erector viridi, specifically the causation. If we can relate the causation to development of fever, we can literally be able to combat this condition of stage three patients more confidently. Now, these stage three patients, certain drugs are used. The, it's, it's, it's pretty tough to explain every drug here. So I made a list. These drugs are used in 200C in a very frequent repetitions, eight to, two, eight, eight to 24 hourly durations, because the, this pathology is too much aggressive. So arsenicum album, acid muriaticum, ferrum ars, black acid, calcarea salve, pulsatilla, Marxol, Sambucus nigra, Antimtat, and Carbo vegetabilis. Some drugs we have used in lower dilutions when the patient developed acute dyspnea crisis. The patient, it may happen happened with anyone of COVID that the, all of a sudden the patient develops a dyspnea crisis. So in that condition, we have used amygdala amara, senega, aspidosparma, Aurelia racemosa, Grindelia robusta, Lobelia inflata, Blata orientalis, Balsamum peruvium, Yerba santa. Certain patients have complicated with cardiac complaints, cardiac expression of disease. We have used Lycopus virginicus, Stropanthus, Stigmata medes, Gallianthus nivealis. We must remember COVID pneumonia is causing the dyspnea as well as the acute respiratory failure. It's due to pulmonary edema with or without cardiac failure. Hence, we sought help of those drugs, particularly having affinity to clear lung flooding. Over the here to mention the use of certain drugs in lower dilutions 6C, 12C, Aspidosparma, Acid Hydrocyanicum, Lorocerasus, Haliborus Niger. At this stage, these patients are often oxygen needed. They need oxygen. So an use of oxygen is of paramount importance. And use of assisted breathing techniques like throning is very, very important to maintain an adequate saturation. Grade four patients. They are patients, the patients who are decompensated already and prominent signs of coagulopathy. At this stage, it seemed with a very little experience of minors, absolutely prefer to refer the patient to intensive units as always a chance of multi-organ failure supervenes. Whenever, whatever, certain drugs seems to come handy and may save a soul. Most importantly, the Ophidia group of drugs like Cotella solidus, Elaps corallinus, Nejatropidians, and Lacasis. The acid group can be helped. These acid group drugs can be of use in any, any of those stages. But at this fourth stage of, of this coagulopathy DIC condition, these drugs can be of intense help. They are acid sulfurous, acid sulfuric, acid hydrocyanic, acid muriatic, arnica montana, ammon carb, midifolia, and agraphis paniculata. Endographis paniculata. In this small premise, I still try to uh, incorporate certain drugs which I have used very frequently while dealing with the COVID patients. In the short, their indications in too brief, like natromuriaticum, is the constitution of the natromuriaticum and the commencing with excessive sneezing, 9 to 10, 11, and chill, and the continuous chill with cold surface. Dalkamara, cold damp exposure, evening chill with thirst and the prominent cataract affections. Patient might have diarrhea, excessive amount of sneezing, excessive amount of rhinorrhea, excessive amount of even excessive amount of cough with expectoration, etc. Gelsemium, the most important point for gelsemium prescription here is that chilliness without thirst and extreme shivers. Arsenic mild, the constitution, heavy fever like, sneezing, aggravating more sneeze. Just I have shared with you all, fever with diarrhea. Ferrum phosphoricum, that particular stage one fever when the fever is just coming and the entire body is showing the first, very first, very 
beginning phase of inflammatory affections and there is a particular time of chill that's 1 pm chill if we ever get this kind of uh, time modalities this might help us intensely in treatment of covid-19 rhinia the chill with sour smelling sweat and recombinant vertigo is a very very important good point for prescription of rhinia along with other rhinia points we have understood and dealt with so far next is that rustox that's modality is very important of rustox modality there is excessive body ache excessive muscular pain and there is a continuous desire to stretch the limb the patient wants to stretch the limb always and the tongue and the particular thrust all symptoms of influenza like illness with a very low blood pressure these patients are often the low bp patients this patient gives a history of previous history of always having a low blood pressure during the flu time the blood pressure is also less so in this condition this influenzinum can be given oscilococcinum is another very important drug especially used during the very beginning phase beginning of ili with excessive obsession for cleaning and the cramps in abdomen with fitted diarrhea these patients are basically too much obsessed with cleaning second stage we have got magnu like anosmia and hypogeusia following coriza liver pain constipation characteristic heart symptoms and headache mortalities these are the this is the thing i have used and i have seen it work calcium sulf is a very important drug do not used in the very beginning phase but can be used when there there is significant secondary pneumonia has developed secondary bacterial infection in the lung with pus formation yellow expectoration and the pyrexia is a swinging pyrexia and they are often accompanied by herpes labialis as we all know it's in complication of pneumonia next is arnica montana that's head hot body cold body hot feet and hand cold hemorrhagic manifestation and characteristic stupor the next drug is very important in relationship with coronavirus covid-19 that's bacteria the tongue fever approaching a typhoid state offensive expressions stool and extreme soreness the chill is chill if present is coming in morning about 11 am veritrum album and veritrum viridi this two in very important drug we have kept in reserve that's a collapse condition and associated with extreme chill with thirst extreme purging extreme vomiting and we must differentially diagnose veritrum album and veritrum album especially especially with camphora high temperature and and often these patients are developing atrial fibrillation of flutter or the different kinds of tachycardias moxol is very important that the fever and the chill is coming at night nightly chill no relief from sweating offensiveness and tap entim tart characteristic lung sim- lung symptoms the lung is flooding with pus lung is flooding with exudations and the tongue with red elevated papillae 6 to 8 pm high rise of the temperature but there is no sweating the high rise of temperature takes place about 6 to 8 pm and there is absolutely no sweat again carbo vegetabilis we know that as master kent have said that carbo veg acid muriaticum and arsenicum album can can save someone from the jaws of death similarly this carbo veg can be used when there is a breathing tendency extreme weakness wont swelling dyspepsia and there is a rapid sinking of the vitality with a rapid fall of spo2 during the phase of treatment of covid-19 we have also used certain drugs which are less known like aspidosperma like aridictyon like balsamum peru like quindelia robusta like senega apocyanum cannabinum rosa damsana aram draconatum aridia resimosa mephitis lemna minor lufa perculata sambucus nigra drugs in high potency is used in acute dyspnea crisis when there is a very beginning dyspnea of covid the patient is having difficulty of breathing this drug in high potency is in frequent repetitions often aborted this dyspnea trouble of the patient calibacrom arsenicum album hipasal spongia tosta adrenalinum phosphorus cpr acid hydrocyanicum lacasis drosera and heliborus so before i share the cases 
in this limited platform and limited time span. I would like to share the details of a film case. In brief, to enumerate the approach I have I, I, I used in treatment of COVID-19 with homeopathy, the patient pool has been taken from South Kolkata region, Bhattanagar, Boj Boj, Behala, Alipur, New Alipur, and Taratara region. So here I'm giving a case report of a category one case. XYZ gets a symptom of flu and choriza. Initially was aperexic, was on May 11, 2020. There was a frontal headache with a congestive throbbing, worse from blowing the nose and bending forward exertion. She had increased thirst, prefers to rest in complete silence. Brianna 200C photos were given. In after two days, 13th, there was no relief. The weakness was prominent, intensely prominent weakness. Headache now accompanying nausea and the vomiting. Body temperature about 9 m, shooted up to 102 degree Fahrenheit. Dry heat without any sweat. The cough appeared aggravation by lying down. The thirst was taken, takes water in seeps, and the patient is preferring warm drinks. Prefers lying with covered. RT-PCR for COVID came positive. SpO2 was more or less in a range where we must not worry. We need not to worry. All other parameters were normal. Arsenic album 30C. One probule was given. In 15th of May, there was no fever. There was no cough. Although intense prostration and mild weakness was persisting. So Alistonia scoleris was given five drops three times a day for seven days. In 20 of the May, the patient was absolutely fine. He was he had a significant amount of appetite and she took rest and she is doing well so far. So here is an example of the category two patient. So let us I, I shall be sharing this slide with a with like a trail of thought so that I can share what I had to face or we had to face during this category two patients and these patients were very very common during that particular time of May and Feb, March, April and May, June month of 2021. So in second of the 2 10, 20, the fever came of 102 degree Fahrenheit. Malaise was there, there was no thirst and there was severe chill, must be held type of shaking. So prescription was gel semi 200. The fever went subsided in two days, but the anosmia and hypochusia, constipation and significantly painful liver region there was a cough in the midnight and the patient was RT-PCR positive. So a dose of mad mu was given. Hypogestion and anosmia went persistent. Body temperature first drop in three days. The patient was a pyrex the pyrexic for three days, three to four days, and the first reduction of temperature was found in three days. However, the average temperature taken six to eight times a day remained about 100 degree Fahrenheit. I prescribed 5300C, 4 doses OD. In 7th, the fever again reappeared, and this time with significant amount of violence. The fever shooted up to 102 degree Fahrenheit with ill expectoration. The patient was having a morning and evening biphasic rise of temperature. The CTS was 24. There was soul burning and bathing aversion on the basis of this. Calcarea sulfurica, 200C, 1 dose was prescribed. In 9th, the fever was subsided. There was no cough, no expectoration, and fever in SPO2 chart I have given later on. Now we'll be sharing a stage three patient. These are just to exemplify what happens, how, how frequently this the disease drug picture, the disease picture is changing in COVID, can change in COVID in a single patient. We have got, we have seen morning one, one symptomatology and in evening another type of symptomatology with fever shooting high up. This patient was on 12th of May. There was a fever in 103 degree Fahrenheit. There was sneezing and heat dry, high thirst for cold. So as aconite was prescribed. In 13, in one day, in less than 24 hours, the fever was 102 degree Fahrenheit, persistent, cough, yellow skin expectation. The first, the patient developed a dyspnea. 
the dyspnea was a bit worse from sitting up. The patient was excessively susceptible to cold. So Hepasulf was given and Senega was given, but the patient didn't have to take it. In 15 for 21, the fever was 101 degree Fahrenheit, all was same as before. So Hepasulf continued. In 17th, fever 100 degree, dyspnea was better. Expectoration was reduced. As because in 15, there was significant expectoration. The change of Senega to balsamum peruvium were done because balsamum peruvium is absolutely a drug which can suit to development of severe, significant secondary infection in the lung with asthmatic conditions. In 18th, after sixth day, the first body temperature dropped down to baseline that was 97.6 degree, degree Fahrenheit. But there were extreme weakness, extreme congestive headache, extreme constipation. Again, the, just like the previous patient, the patient was having a right upper abdominal pain. And prominent anosmia and hypogeusia were still prominent. So I sought help from Magnum 200 C1 dose. And the PCR came down negative. In the last, no fever, no dyspnea, smell and taste were gradually returning. The patient, was, the patient was gradually returning after two days, smell and taste and extreme weakness and offensive stool. So the patient was supplied Sorinum 201 dose and advised to take after two weeks of absolute recovery as an antisodic and to reduce the, the relic of the severe acute disease. This is an important prescription. I wanted to share that is a case four, that's category three. Mrs. Ghosh, Ms. Ghosh, she was a 38 year Hindu female. Her PCR was positive. Her body temperature was 20, 10, 20, was 103 degree Fahrenheit. She happened to have marked diarrhea, surface cold, more scolding. Show was given camp for 200. In two days at 7 a.m., her body temperature was 100 degree Celsius, 100 degree Fahrenheit. She had marked chill, extreme body ache, and thirst, and all complaints getting ameliorated from exertion. So in one or two days, the entire symptomatic picture has changed. So also the drug. I took help from Rustox 200C. On 23rd night, about 2 a.m., the body temperature was 100 degree Fahrenheit. I got the call from a for the patient and the patient experienced sudden starting of nocturnal dyspnea. She was, her SpO2 was 94. And everything happened in only 24 hours, all of a sudden. At that time, she was given, given she was asked to take arsenic amalgam 200 C. And she was, she had that 200 C, one drop every two hourly and arrange a nasal oxygen cylinder and nasal, nasal oxygen arrangement in 2.5 to 3 liter per minute. And Aspidus Palma was given mother tincture to clear to uh, to be taken in 10 drops for two hours. And the same day, in the same day, about afternoon at 1 p.m., the body temperature was 99.9 degree Fahrenheit. The dyspnea was better and the oxygen continued, but not in not in continuous way. It was given in in in, in, in episodic way. In 23rd, on the same day at 9 p.m., the body temperature again shooted up to 102 degree Fahrenheit. Dyspnea as if lung constricted, and there was sweat and sleeping. The, the sweat and sleeping, sweat, there was no sweat and sleeping. Sorry for the type mistake. There was no sweat and sleeping, and the cuff was dry. The dyspnea was on lying down. Just like giving a true picture of Sambuca Snagra, I gave her Sambuca Snagra 206 doses. And Aranya Resimosa was again supplied to be taken in an SOS if emergency condition develops to take. So then what happened? In 24th, early morning about 10 a.m., the body temperature was 99 degree Fahrenheit and SpO2 was 97. So there was general better feeling, nausea and attempt to eat. On 24th, the same day, about 1 p.m., the body temperature again dropped down to 98.6 degree Fahrenheit. The oxygen was advised to continue. In 24th, 11 p.m., the body temperature was 98.7 degree Fahrenheit. The SpO2 was 97 to 98. In 25th, again, the same thing happened. Oxygen was withdrawn. The previous, uh, previous, as we can see in the previous slide, 
the nasal, nasal oxygen supply was reduced to 0 0.5 LPM. In 25th, again, the PCR came down negative. In 28th, the patient was well. Her reassessment were done and a constitutional drug was given that was CPR 200, one doses, one dose. Now, this is the case five, category three to shift to category four for Mr. TGR, which she was also positive. In 9-5-21, the fever was 102. Tongue side coated, confocational, cold damp exposure, profuse rhinorrhea on the basis of this dal 200 was prescribed. On 12, 11 a.m., body temperature was 101 degree Fahrenheit. It was little less, but there was severe diarrhea and offensive, offensive, that was very offensive. SPO2 dropped down to 94, BP dropped down to 100 by 60. There was offensive stool and the patient was pretty, pretty weak, lying down. So he was given Bacticia. In 14.5.21, the body temperature was 100 degree Fahrenheit. Diarrhea subsided and intense throbbing head headache intervened. Temperature rising at night and the sweating doesn't relieve. So Maxol 200, one dose was given. In plain water, head wash if temperature rises was advised. On the next day noon, the body temperature again shooted down to 103 degree Fahrenheit. Stool and urine output were reduced. CRP and LDH were a little bit raised. Hydrogenium 200, one dose were given. And in one dose were given, the patient has a palpitations and the patient were sore all over. I took up his call and he was, he was lying down, couldn't even talk from high temperature. He was palpitating. She was, he was giving pyrogenium. Along with that, as an SOS, if a lung is severe, significant heart condition might develop, norocerasis Q were prescribed with an advice not to take that if until and unless an SOS condition can, ashes condition is developing, an emergency condition is developing. And the patient were also advised to consider admission. So by about 16th afternoon, the body temperature first returned down to 99 degree Fahrenheit and the urine output little increased. So we gave phytum. In 17th, 10 a.m., the body temperature again returned down to 97.6. In 18, the body temperature was 97.3 and there was a distest in mouth, occasional frontal headache and occasional cough. And on auscultation, there were signs of tracheitis were there. So I gave Stictopalmonaria 6C and three doses, gargle and advice to gargle, gargle in lukewarm water. But, but in 20, there were no significant complaints. The patient was fit and fine. In 23, the patient was again, case taking was done, a constitutional drug of, as in the form of Marturia solubilis, 200C was described. The patient recovered without any significant major disabilities, clinical disabilities. So here we can see the change of oxygen saturation. As we can see the morning, afternoon, evening and taken in a small gap of 30 to 20 minutes. And in the next day, after two days, how the saturation has changed. The saturation was dropping and the saturation changed with medications as I have prescribed. And the saturation was changed and uh, the saturation which was dropping previously got somehow, got, uh, somehow into the proper range where it should be for a healthy, adult healthy human being. Here again, we can see the conversion of uh, seropositivity. So there is a category two, category three and category four patient. We can see all of them are positive. They were from a single family. They're from the same family. And here of the report of the same, same family, these patients recovered in, in only four, uh, two to uh, three to five days time without any significant complications and their PCR report came down from positive to negative. So what are the points to be noted while treating a COVID case as I myself have perceived? This, this after saying all these big things in, this, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sharing platform, I must do something I thought that which will help us to understand this sickness and how we can take an approach to deal with it. Help from all group drugs, be it plant, be it animal, be it mineral, be it sarcoda, be it nosod may be necessary. Drugs like oscillococcinum and influenginum is best used in very beginning, in the very beginning of the sickness to arrest the entire disease process. 
usually given in high potency, surcoats and no source may be needed in any time of the treatment. Even if a constitutional drug doesn't have a prominent present complaint like fever, it might change the scenario and can save a life. Oximeter and oxygen concentrator are important at once for the management, especially in needed group of patients. Arsenicum album, cupram metallicum, cupram uh, hydrocyanicum acidum, spongia are best used in acute dyspneic crisis in high potency and with frequent repetitions. As we have seen, balsam of peruvium, erudiction is best used when there is a secondary pneumonia and it is best given with some form of warm, warm drinks so that the patient can expectorate properly. Proning is important. Concluding and treatment with an antimyosmetic constitution is necessary to reduce the chance of long COVID or post-COVID syndrome. Anacardium can be very, very useful in post-COVID brain fat syndrome. So here is the references where I have taken my data from my study on the human physiology, pathology, respiratory pathology, and chest medicine. Now at the very conclusion of the seminar, I would like to share a few experiences of those vicious people, those persons who sought soul health from homeopathy during their and their families' COVID-19 crisis. We, we can now hear them, that what they are saying, that how homeopathy worked from, the, worked from them. And I personally, as being a, their physician, thank them for giving us the chance and giving us the chance and believing in during their entire family's COVID-19 crisis. घबड़े ग चलते बराबरीटिवल तो नमस्कार घोष दीर्घदिन होमिओपैथी मेडिसिन व्यवहार करगत बहु बचर डर तीर्थंकर बनार्जी पेशेंट हमें लास्ट इयर टू थाउजेंड टोटी ते पुजो ठीक आगे हमारे कोविड धरा पड़े पंचमी दिन आई वज डायगनोसड उथ द सीमटम्स अफ स्मेल एंड टेस्टलेसनेस इनिशियी दोटो सीमटम छाड़ा अन्न कोकम सीमटम छो ना जदिव से ही मुहूर्ते डर बनार्जी दोटो ओषुदा के दिए दें और पुजो ये खे हमार अक्सिजें चेक कर उन्नी एडभाइस करें और ओषुदा शुरू कर दी पंचमी दिन थी हटात कर सप्तमी रे इट वज अ नाइटमेयर सप्तमी राते ब्रिथलेसनेस और चेस्ट टाइटनेस शुरू है जदिव एर आगे अक्सिजें डेफिसियसर को एक्सपिरियन्स हमारे छा तर आदे अक्सिजें डेफिसियसि हई कूडेंट रियलाइज 
তারপর আমি বুঝতে পারি আমার সারা ঘরের মধ্যে যে কষ্টটা হচ্ছে বুকের মধ্যে একটা চাপ চাপ ব্যথা এবং আমার ইমিডিয়েট পাশে আমার মা রয়েছে আমি আমার মাকে ডাকতেও ভীষণ কষ্ট অনুভব হচ্ছিল আমার একটা ফেশিয়ালি মুখ বেঁকে যাওয়া কথা বলতে পারার কষ্ট হওয়া এই জিনিসগুলো হচ্ছিল সারা রাত আমি এই কষ্টের মধ্যে দিয়ে যাই ভোরবেলা আমি ডক্টর ব্যানার্জিকে জাস্ট একটা মেসেজ করতে পারি ইমিডিয়েটলি উনি আমাকে মেডিসিন দেন এবং সেই মেডিসিন আগের মেডিসিনের সঙ্গে আমি কন্টিনিউ করি দুদিনের মধ্যে আমার এই কষ্টটা অনেকটা কমে আসে ইনফ্যাক্ট সেই দিনই অক্সিজেন ডিফিসিয়েন্সি বা চেস্টের টাইটনেসের ব্যাপারটা অনেকটাই কমে আসে তারপর আগামী কদিন উনি যা ওষুধ দিয়েছিলেন ফর দ্য কোভিড ওনলি আমি সেটা সম্পূর্ণ কোর্স কমপ্লিট করি এবং বাকি সব নিয়ম মেনে লক্ষ্মী পুজো সো নমস্কার সো অ্যাজ উই हैव আন্ডারস্টুড দ্যাট ট্রিটিং কোভিড নিউমোনিয়া অর ডিসপ্লিয়া মাই বি চ্যালেঞ্জিং বাট ইটস ইন্টারেস্টিং টু এন্ড হেল্পিং ওয়ান সোল फ्रॉम আ চেস্ট টাইটনেস এন্ড ডিসপ্লিয়া এন্ড ফিভার can bring us a lot of joy as we know you all are trying our best at every part of the world to courage in you know, with courage in our heart and hope in our mind to win over this disastrous this demonic demonic monster covid 19 we can i believe and we all believe that covid 19 will be over soon thank you all thank you very much uh really mesmerizing speech and uh, what to say uh, ashok sir and uh, kalyani sir i think uh, the purpose of our cme is now evolving out a uh, very junior dr titanka banerji uh, had shown his courage yes sir sir bolu uh, there is some problem i think your your voice is not clear anyway uh, dr tithankar banerji what he has presented is beautiful very much encouraging and uh, definitely it will help and it will encourage us to fight with covid 19 since beginning of this cme we are dealing with this covid management from all over country we have collected the information different cmes that homeopathy can definitely deal with covid 19 uh, except for the cases where sub- substitute of some management essential regarding oxygen and other hospital management otherwise initial cases and moderate cases to some extent serious cases homeopathy can definitely deal with so many thanks to Dr. Banerjee for providing us little information and his clinical experiences. Thank you very much. We all hope that you will fight with COVID-19 with carry on and try to uh, bring more references in your future. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Kona, sir. Please. Over to you, uh, Dr. Kona, sir. Mm-hmm. Good evening. Uh, really, uh, Dr. Titho, he has de- uh, elaborately described the very nicely no doubt and first of all he told in the beginning i'm going to elaborate the uh, covid 19 he was uh, telling that about modality so yes it is fact that when we are going to treatment the modality is the most important uh, we must not avoid the modality so and this in this case in covid 19 it is challenging and we can help lots and i may think in homeopathy can challenge it if we get scope in about the covid so we can face and we can it is it is challenge we can take it challenge and he has treated so many patients and he elaborately he has described and no doubt but i may say something about that whether we are going to prescribe in covid 19 or related covid 19 and symptoms first of all the symptoms we must have to follow the symptoms totality and 
really in case of it is if we think it is first of acute conditions and then when we will go to the prescribe suppose i am giving the example in the arsenic or arsenic iodide or ipratum perfotum or belladonna or gelsemium the such lives so we must compare the each other medicines and we cannot give but i have seen the arsenic album the frequently given the doses but it is also we have read the arsenic and album cannot prescribe the more doses if arsenic album works then it should be stopped the arsenic should not be repeat so it is he has given he has treated and we cannot prescribe the specially the patient in having the symptoms the dyspnea or fever or headache we must of take the symptoms totality and then i go to the take the treatment he has done but sometimes about the case of four and five i may think he has frequently changes the medicines okay what he, he has seen the cases and basically in case of five and free uh, frequently he has changes he has got the symptoms and he has got the modality and he according to his thinking he has prescribed no doubt uh, it is very encouraging and very nicely dr titho you have described and carried on and covid 19 we can challenge it and you take it challenge and i hope so if we get chance in totally so i think that covid we can help in among in all over india and we have uh, in homeopathy we have seen the all over india and homeopathy works but i have seen again i am telling that excessively abuse of arsenic album it should be stopped this is my point okay dr bitu thank you dr bidut dr bidut hello dr bidut uh, thank you ashok sir thank you uh. ashok sir uh, now i will request uh, uh, dr shupriya de to deliver his speech and we are eager to learn and listen from another young and energetic learned alumnus of nih over to you shupriyo uh, i think you are in the back stage here is it good evening shupriyo stage is all yours good evening sir very good evening you can start so, please on. yes sir um uh, doctor so please just uh, click on the hide option right beside the stop sharing part okay is it fine now now what is yes sir okay so good evening everyone respected teachers my batchmates and juniors whoever uh, listening this cb uh, dr tirthankar banerji my senior my senior and very close one and he has elaborated nicely the covid part and now it's my turn to say something about respiratory illness and its homeopathic management i will also say at the end uh, what i have seen little bit but uh, i will little bit go to the theoretical part what we understand about respiratory illness okay <clears throat> now the purpose of my part is in india 
uh, we rank second in the world in death due to various respiratory diseases. Particularly, we won't discuss the rare diseases, but we will discuss the most commoner part, that is the COPD and bronchial asthma mainly. In 2020, approx 2.5 lakhs people died due to respiratory illness, excluding the death due to COVID-19. If we sum up, it will cross lakhs. But excluding COVID-19, it's around 2.5 lakhs. And Indian climate is very humid and shabby type, and it is very much suitable for various respiratory illness, especially bronchial asthma and COPD. So it's a burning issue where the high mortality rate as well as morbidity rate, mortality rate, both are high. Now, broad spectrum classification. I have broadly classified respiratory diseases into two parts, that is COPD and bronchial asthma. And COPD means two parts, that is emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Now, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, bronchial asthma, all these come under obstructive pulmonary diseases. What is obstructive pulmonary disease and what is restrictive pulmonary disease? When we are unable to inhale the air, when we are unable to inhale the air, that is somewhere there is restriction in the tracheobronchial tree. Somewhere there is restrictions. It comes under the restrictive disease. It can be kyphoscoliosis. There are a lot others. Restrictive part. I won't go deep into the restrictive part. Okay. Uh, in the acute interstitial lung disease. Okay, fine. And uh, COPD, emphysema, and chronic bronchitis, these all comes under the obstructive disease where we are unable to exhale the inhaled air. That is somewhere there is obstruction so that we can't exhale the inhaled air. As a result of which, always in the obstructive disease, the lungs are hyperinflated, full of air within the lungs we see. Okay. Respiratory failure. We see type 1 respiratory failure. What is type 1 respiratory failure? There is failure of oxygenation and characterized by low partial pressure of oxygen goes down. Okay. Characterized by a low partial pressure of oxygen with normal or low uh, partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, partial pressure of carbon dioxide may be low or normal in the respiratory failure type 1. Example are bronchial asthma, COPD, pneumonia, ARDS, pulmonary edema. COPD, when in the initial phase, it comes under respiratory uh, failure type 1. But when it becomes chronic one, when patient suffers from long time from COPD, then it comes under type 2 respiratory failure, represents a defect in ventilation, hypoventilation that is, and characterized by decreased partial pressure of oxygen goes down. But here, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide goes up. And what I have said, when COPD continues for a long time, it comes under, it turns into type 2 respiratory failure, but also due to chest wall deformities, uh, respiratory muscle weakness, and CNS depression. Okay, now comes the main part, bronchial asthma. This is bronchial asthma, acute inflammatory disorder of airways, where the tracheobronchial tree shows hyper-responsiveness to multiplicity of the intrinsic and extrinsic stimuli. Two types of stimuli we get, what we get from outside, that is extrinsic, and what we inherit from inside, that is, comes under the intrinsic part. Okay, producing reversible airflow obstruction, which may be due to muscle spasm, mucosal edema, mucosal edema, and excessive mucus secretion characterized by paroxysms of, these are the chief characteristic symptoms what we see, dyspnea, cough, tightness of chest, and wheeze. But one thing must be remembered that bronchial asthma is reversible. So we can treat successfully bronchial asthma, but we get little bit obstruction, and we face difficulty in treating COPD because COPD is little bit reverse, irreversible and so we face difficulties in treating COPD. It takes a longer, longer bit of time to cure COPD. Okay. Classification of bronchial asthma, what I have said earlier, extrinsic asthma, allergic asthma. Okay. 
what we see here history of atopy is present attacks related to environmental exposure uh, when uh, someone becomes asthmatic working in um, heavy polluted areas busy uh, where there a lot of smoke dust okay what we get from outside that is attacks environmental exposure ig antibody levels uh, immunoglobulin e is always high early onset of disease is it's seen in young mainly usually is less severe okay intrinsic asthma idiosyncratic asthma okay this is what inherited from uh, family history okay no history of atopy concomitant nasal polyps are usually present and patients are aspirin sensitive okay occurs without provocation it don't require any external stimuli it occurs without provocation ig antibody levels are normal delayed onset it's seen in usually in adult more severe persistent asthma it is more threatening and the another part uh, what we call it as status asthmaticus it is a severe airway obstruction where the paroxysms of acute asthmatic attacks occur without any remission in between it don't uh, it won't give any gap to breathe continuous there will be gasping breathing and uh, patient will face a lot of difficulty in taking breath it don't allow the patient to breathe freely okay clinical features of bronchial asthma what we see in bronchial asthma respiratory distress with acute paroxysms at times dyspnea with cough at times and uh, i have uh, given here four levels level 1 dyspnea on excessive exertion on excessive exertion if you see uh, dyspnea it comes in the level 1 walking rapidly on level ground walking lap rapidly on level ground if dyspnea occurs walking rapidly on level ground it comes in level 2 uh level 3 has to stop after some distance that is intermittent claudication what we know uh, what the term goes here intermittent claudication walk for a few distance then he need to stop and take rest okay level 3 and level 4 even at rest if the patient is lying or sitting even at rest then also dyspnea it comes under level 4 then the next uh, clinical feature is tightness of chest i have seen uh, history of um, the history of seasonal variation must seasonal whatever seasonal variation the bronchial asthma patient becomes worse from cold to hot season or hot to cold whatever and dust and smoke also aggravates the symptoms okay history of acute attacks of allergic rhinitis allergic rhinitis what we initially see in our uh, clinics and uh, opd what patient mainly comes with acute rhinitis rhinorrhea coryza acute cold uh, then it turns into day by day then it turns into breathlessness breathing difficulty shortness of breath then it turns into bronchial asthma bronchiolitis and it turns even it turns into copd what we initially see the patient is mainly allergic rhinitis running nose and uh, breathlessness shortness of breath and coryza okay on examination findings of bronchial asthma what we see decubitus is propped up he can't lie down partially respiration intercostal suction present nasal polyps usually present on palpation we see apex pit can't be localized vocal fremitus decreased on percussion resonance all over the chest on auscultation on placing the stethoscope we get the vesicular breath sounds with prolonged expiration wheez mainly during expiration we don't find here crepitus what mainly seen in bronchial asthma is wheez all over and pulses paradoxes commonly present okay investigations of bronchial asthma moreover uh, more or less uh, every respiratory illness that is bronchial asthma copd investigation part is more or less same okay what we initially will do pulmonary function test that is pyrometric test the hallmark of the obstructive lung disease is decreased expiratory flow rate that is fev1 fev1 that is forced expiratory volume in first second is typically reduced out of proportion to the forced vital capacity that we if we uh, do a 
percentage calculation FEV1 by FVC ratio it comes always less than 70% where FEV1 is reduced more than FVC. What I have told earlier also obstructive lung disease means the patient can't inhale properly the fresh air. Hey, sorry, sorry. Uh, the patient can't exhale the inhaled air properly. So the lungs becomes that what uh, is seen in the chest x-ray. That is the lungs becomes hyperinflated. Hyperinflated as the time passes on. That is hyperinflated lung field is seen in the chest x-ray. Then what is seen, uh, what we can do, that is ABG analysis, arterial blood gas analysis, hypoxia and respiratory acidosis is seen with hypercarbia. Carbon dioxide level goes up because we can't exhale that carbon dioxide part. Okay. Blood culture, we can see eosinophilia that is in mainly seen in the extrinsic type. Uh, sputum, we can see few characteristic parts in the sputum. Um, that is charcoal laden crystals, crushed man spirals, and criola bodies. These three are very important in the uh, sputum test. Now, important to note what I have seen very difficult to segregate that is bronchial asthma and cardiac asthma. Bronchial asthma, there will be usually there is allergy and atopy, history of allergy and atopy, but in cardiac asthma, there will be no history of allergy, nothing, no provocations will be there. Family history often positive in cardiac asthma, usually absent. Onset late night or early morning, but in cardiac asthma, we see uh, mainly the patient uh, condition aggravates in the early hours of night and midnight, in midnight part mainly night and midnight, but in bronchial asthma early very early morning in the dawn part okay age usually bronchial asthma usually any age usually young cardiac asthma usually seen in the older age group okay clinical features what we see in the bronchial asthma scanty mucoid and tenacious expectoration in cardiac asthma uh, in bron uh, sorry in bronchial asthma we see scanty mucoid and tenacious expectoration uh, in cardiac asthma profuse pinkish and frothy expectoration Wheeze is very much present in bronchial asthma as compared to cardiac asthma. In bronchial asthma, pulsus paradoxus is seen, but in cardiac asthma, pulsus alternance is seen. Okay. Pulsus alternance is seen. Uh, then in bronchial asthma, obliteration of liver and cardiac dullness. We can't palpate the liver. <coughs> Uh, obliteration of the liver dullness. We can't uh, localize the liver dullness and cardiac dullness. Cardiac dullness may be increased in case of cardiac asthma due to left ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, may have silent chest. This silent chest is usually seen in status asthmaticus, what I have discussed earlier. And in cardiac asthma, breath sound not altered. We have normal breath sound we can find. Okay. <clears throat> now, emphysema. Now, emphysema, uh, I have told earlier, it is a part of that COPD, uh, obstructive disease. Okay. Uh, it's a re irreversible one and it is popularly known as pink puffers. But why the name given pink puffers? These patients are not cyanose. They don't turn blue. So, uh, what they turn into? They turn pinkish, pink, because the arterial oxygen is sufficient to saturate the hemoglobin and try to blow off the excessive carbon dioxide that is puffers. They puffs out the excess carbon dioxide. They maintain a near normal partial pressure of oxygen <coughs> and carbon dioxide. The patients are usually lean and thin. What we see in our daily practice also, the patients are usually lean and thin. <coughs> Permanent dilatation of airway. Now the definition part. Permanent dilatation of permanent, that is irreversible process is seen here. Okay. Uh, that is, uh, if we say the miasmatic analysis, it comes under the syphilitic miasm more than the soric and syphilitic. Achha, okay. Permanent dilatation of airway distal to tunnel bronchioles where only air conduction occurs. Here only air conduction occurs with or without fibrosis. Fibrosis may or may not occur, but the alveoli, alveolar sac are usually fibrosed and with loss of normal architecture. The normal architecture, the 
alveolar sac becomes fibrosed and the inner wall gets damaged destruction of the alveolar septa is seen so uh, since the alveolar septa damaged so it becomes little bit we face little bit difficulty in treating as well as curing in a smoother and rapid way this emphysema okay okay now types of emphysema what are the types we get panacinar centriacinar and paraseptal what is panacinar acini the acinis are uniformly involved from level of respiratory bronchioles to terminal blind blind alveoli that is all the things happens in the lower respiratory tract it doesn't involve much the upper respiratory tract okay acinis are uniformly involved from level of respiratory bronchioles to terminal blind alveoli lesions are more common in the lower zone and bases occurs in association with alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency what is this alpha 1 antitrypsin it is a chemical uh, it is a chemical enzyme actually it is a enzyme that um, inactivates the neutrophils that inactivates the neutrophils and helps us against a lot of diseases so since this alpha 1 antitrypsin this enzyme gets diminished or damaged so panacinar emphysema what the patient suffers from then centriacinar central or proximal part now here comes the central or proximal part that is little bit of upper respiratory bronchioles here involved uh, formed by the respiratory bronchioles are affected whereas distal alveoli are spared lesions severe and commoner in the upper lobes mainly in the smokers centriacinar is mainly seen in the smokers so my request uh, please quit smoking to avoid suffering from emphysema mainly the centriacinar type then paraseptal involves distal part of acini while the proximal part is normal it again the paraseptal also involves the distal part uh, okay localized along the pleura and along the perilobular septa it is localized along the pleura that is terminal um, that is the peripheral part peripheral part extreme pleura it, it is localized along the pleura and along the perilobular septa okay now what we see in emphysema on inspection we see barrel shaped chest barrel shaped chest what we see the ribs are the ribs are horizontally placed the ribs are in parallelly placed palpation apex bit can't be localized chest uh, movement diminished vocal fremitus di diminished percussion hyper resonant lungs since in emphysema lot of air gets entrapped the hyper resonant lungs loss of cardiac dullness as well as hepatic dullness on auscultation vesicular breath sound seen on prolonged expiration vocal resonance diminished okay investigations uh, more or less same what i have said uh, spirometry then on chest x ray hyper inflated lungs marked radio lucent radio translucent lung field is seen elongation of the cardiac shadow becomes elongated uh, we can do a cbc arterial blood gas analysis we can uh, see uh, in detecting the partial pressure of oxygen as well as carbon dioxide sputum test we can do to detect any sort of chest infection and uh, most importantly if all these fails to detect emphysema we can do a high resolution ct scan of chest okay now comes the chronic bronchitis chronic bronchitis also a subtype of copd earlier one was emphysema and this one is chronic bronchitis now why chronic bronchitis is called blue blotters why the name blue blotters because here the patient suffers from cyanosis they turns blue they turns blue edematous they becomes blotted and thus the patient are usually called as blue blotters or rather the disease is known as blue blotters cough with sputum production here cough 
here the paroxysms of cough and sputum production will be a lot more is the main feature with uh, while dyspnea is less common also known as winter's cough and smoker's cough chronic bronchitis is usually seen in chain smokers <clears throat> chain smokers and those who work in coal mines dust areas for a longer period of time and is also seen mainly in the winter season okay then next one what is chronic bronchitis by definition it is a clinical condition associated with excessive mucus production along with cough for at least we must uh, in clinics in our clinics and opd we must at least clinically we must say a patient is having chronic bronchitis only if he is suffering from three successive months with chronic with severe paroxysms of cough in a year and that too it will continue for two consecutive years three consecutive months and it will be two consecutive years then only we can say clinically that the patient might be suffering from chronic bronchitis okay clinical features clinical features what are the signs we can see the patient is overweight usually we can see campbell sign what is campbell sign patient shows downward displacement of trachea during inspiration the trachea goes down while the patient uh, breathes in that breathes in the pure air it is different from tracheal tug seen in the aortic aneurysm it's different from the aortic aneurysm why because the patient is having difficulty in breathing he difficult uh, he breathes with lot of difficulty that is why the trachea displaces downwards okay symptoms what are the symptoms cough with sputum production there will be a lot of sputum production for many years and relatively late onset of breathlessness breathlessness will be in the later part cough present mainly in the winter season associated with smokers what i have said mucopurulent sputum that is a very offensive sputum with a lot of sputum production expectoration will be a lot more in the morning occasionally blood stained and frankly purulent okay on examination findings it will be a more or less same inspection and expanded chest barrel shaped chest on auscultation vesicular breath sound seen inspiration inspiratory and expiratory ronchi here we see uh, ronchi but here crepitation is found lot more in chronic bronchitis at the base of the lung which either disappear or change in location and intensity after coughing okay investigations of chronic bronchitis like what we can do to detect chronic bronchitis pft chest x ray cbc sputum test ecg we can do a ecg because right ventricular hypertrophy as a complication may be seen it uh, it is mainly a complication part of chronic bronchitis so we must do a ecg too uh, to see whether the patient is having right ventricular hypertrophy or not as a complication we can do a high resolution chest uh, ct scan okay next comes the next segment that is bronchiectasis what is bronchiectasis by definition this permanent it is also irreversible pathology permanent and abnormal dilatation of the medium size bronchi with obstructive and inflammatory changes in the wall of the bronchi the most characteristic clinical manifestations is persistent cough with expectoration of copious amount of foul smelling purulent sputum it is very much similar to chronic bronchitis but what i have said earlier in the clinical part that three successive months and two consecutive years it indicates more towards it indicates chronic bronchitis okay uh, and here there will be the mucopurulent sputum production will be more but the cough part will be a lesser one than chronic bronchitis post infectious cases bronchiectasis is seen in post infectious cases commonly developed in childhood and in early adult life okay the read classification what is seen in read classification the dilated airways depending upon their gross or bronchographic appearance have been subclassified into the following different types what are the types of uh, this bronchiectasis cylindrical the most common type characterized by tube like bronchial dilatation cylindrical fusiform spindle shaped bronchial dilatation and the third one secular rounded sac like bronchial dilatation 
and the final one is varicose irregular bronchial enlargement all these are subtypes that is classification of bronchiectasis but these all permanently damage the uh, pathology irreversible pathology it damages the uh, structural uh, structures of the alveo uh, bronchial tree okay cylindrical fusiform secular varicose okay Clinical features, what we see, persistent productive cough, the cough will be a productive one, foul smelling sputum with hemoptysis, hemoptysis will be a lot more, and recurrent pneumonia. All symptoms aggravated in early hours of morning, shortness of breath, clubbing of fingers seen, drumstick type. Chronic sinusitis is a common accompaniment of diffuse bronchiectasis. Okay, uh, clubbing of fingers is seen in more or less every uh, respiratory illness other than chronic bronchitis uh, chronic bronchitis and chronic bronchitis we don't see any clubbing of fingers chronic sinusitis is a common accompaniment of diffuse bronchiectasis febrile episodes seen with severe chest pain and what we see in auscultatory findings inspiratory course crepitation crepitation is seen in the inspiratory phase investigations investigation part is more or less same chest x-ray on chest x-ray what is the special type we see here tram track parallel lines and honeycomb appearance of basal lung in uh, <clears throat> in view box we must check this while treating a patient of bronchiectasis this tram track parallel lines are very prominently seen on bronchoscopy we see uh, hemoptysis to detect the site of hemoptysis where from the hemoptysis is taking place we can do a pft cbc leukocytosis seen mainly sputum test hemophilus influenza seen when kept in a conical glass it shows three layers okay serum immunoglobulin test we can do and we can do a CT scan of chest abnormally widened and thickened airway with an irregular wall lack of visibility of airway in the periphery of lung and finally we can do obviously uh, hrct chest is the gold standard test for confirmatory diagnosis in bronchiectasis the gold standard test is hrct chest if everything fails to reach to a conclusion of detecting bronchiectasis, then we must go for a HRCT chest. Neural effusion. What is pleural effusion? Collection of serous fluid within the pleural cavity. Normally, we can say pleural effusion uh, when the fluid part in between the parietal and the visceral layer exceeds 25 ml when it uh, becomes 30 35 ml 40 ml then we can uh, say clinically that uh, the patient is suffering from pleural effusion when there is imbalance between hydrostatic and colloidal osmotic pressure there will be accumulation of huge amount of fluid only when uh, the hydrostatic and colloidal osmotic pressure imbalance takes place now we must uh, be efficient enough to detect whether it is pleural effusion or congestive cardiac failure. For that we must do in case of pleural effusion a pleural tap as well as a ECG. Pleural effusion plus edema uh, and uh, there is liver dullness then we can think of congestive cardiac failure. In congestive cardiac failure uh, there will be hepatojugular reflux if not uh, hepatojugular reflux is seen in case of car congestive cardiac failure so we must go for a ecg uh, in case of ecg the ejection fraction uh, we must uh, detect the ejection we must see the ejection fraction uh, to segregate whether it is pleural effusion or congestive cardiac failure so it is so we must be very careful whether the patient is having pleural effusion or congestive cardiac failure okay Types of pleural effusion. According to nature of pleural fluid, what we can uh, see according to nature of pleural fluid, hydrothorax, uh, non-inflammatory accumulation of serous fluid within the pleural cavity causes our uh, CCF, congestive cardiac failure, renal failure, cirrhosis of liver, meek syndrome, 
etc the fluid is clear and straw color transuded with specific gravity under 1.012 and protein content below 1 g per tl in mix syndrome we can uh, we see ascites is very common in the mix syndrome okay then next comes the next variety that is hemothorax heme means blood we all know pure blood accumulation of pure blood in the pleural cavity trauma to the what uh, why does this happen so due to mainly trauma to chest wall to thoracic viscera and rupture of aortic aneurysm most common okay third part is chylothorax accumulation of milky fluid of lymphatic origin into the pleural cavity it is rare and uncommon mainly we see what we see is hydrothorax and hemothorax okay clinical features of pleural effusion signs decubitus patient lies try, patient always feels better uh, lying on the affected side respiratory rate high rhythm regular and respiration is abdominothoracic symptoms generalized swelling of the body that is ascites is seen anorexia there will be um, loss of appetite weakness and fatigue <clears throat> respiratory distress will also be there uh, heaviness of the affected side of the chest will also be present on examination findings of pleural effusion on inspection we uh, see intercostal space fullness of the affected side movement diminished on the affected side on palpation we can see trachea shifted to the opposite side since the intercostal there is fullness on the affected side so it pushes the trachea to the normal side that is to the opposite side trachea is shifted okay apex bit can't be localized if left side affected if located in the right side then it will be towards sternum very important to note vocal frame it has diminished on percussion we see stony dullness stony dullness is seen in uh, pleural effusion on auscultation we can see uh, breath sound diminished that is in the vesicular uh, vocal resonance also diminished and adventitious added sounds we added sounds we don't get adventitious sounds are usually absent here investigations uh, we can go for uh, chest x ray homogeneous opacities with carved upper bodies the upper borders um, with carved upper border which is concave medially and upwards what we call is ellis s shaped curve it's very important in case of pleural effusion okay when the pathology is highly advanced uh, we can clearly see this pathology on chest x ray we can do a cbc yes sir will be high aspiration cytology we can always go for an aspiration cytology smear examination of the fluid culture of the aspirated fluid and sputum examination and we can finally go for an fnse or excision biopsy of the lymph nodes lymph nodes are usually affected uh, <clears throat> of the affected side actually types of pneumothorax uh, what are the types of pneumothorax pneumo means air the thorax is full of air okay what are the three types of pneumothorax spontaneous traumatic and artificial spontaneous due to spontaneous rupture of the alveoli in any form of pulmonary disease traumatic due to trauma to the chest wall or lungs ruptured esophagus or stomach and surgical operation of the thorax and artificial induced collapse when artificially induced uh, while treating the chronic pulmonary tb we can see artificial pneumothorax these are the three types of pneumothorax what we can see clinical features and investigations of pneumothorax symptoms respiratory distress will be there with uh, severe bouts of cough chest pain and breathlessness will be there propped up decubitus the patient can't lie down abdominal thorax is respiration seen percussion hyper resonant notes in hyper resonant is quite common since it is pneumothorax that is full of air shifting of liver and cardiac dullness on auscultation diminished vesicular breath sound uh, vocal resonance diminished coin sound is a special type we can hear a coin sound uh, when coins two three coins are rubbed together the sound that is produced we can uh, hear that through our stetho investigations to be done chest x-ray cbc sputum test for afb uh, we must here exclude um, pulmonary tb 
that is why sputum test is done for excluding AFB. PFT we must uh, do to detect COPD in background, whether the um, pneumothorax is occurring due to COPD in background, for that we must do a PFT. Now comes a very important part, pneumonia. What uh, my senior Dada, Dr. Tithankar Manarji has already discussed mainly that pneumonia, pneumonitis, all this comes under mainly uh, COVID part, what uh, people are, we are suffering from last facing problem for last two years. This mainly in the later part, the main pathology what turns is uh, patient are suffering from and at last uh, dies due to pneumonia, pneumonitis. What is definition by pneumo of pneumonia? Uh, by definition, what it says, it's inflammation of lung followed by consolidation and it becomes consolidated and fibrosed and generally having an acute onset, it involves the lung parenchyma distal to the terminal bronchioles consisting of the, that is, what, uh, what is uh, meant by distal to terminal bronchioles, that is consisting of the respiratory bronchiole, alveolar ducts, alveolar sacs, and alveoli. Okay. Pathogenesis of pneumonia. The microorganisms gain entry into the lungs by one of the following four routes, that is inhalation, aspiration, hematogenous spread, that is through blood, and direct spread. The sequence of pathological changes described below represents the inflammatory response of the lungs in bacterial infection. I will discuss the bacterial part. And uh, my previous speaker have dealt with the viral part, but I will deal with the bacterial part. Uh, stage, we all know the four stages of pneumonia, that is stage of congestion, last for one to two days, then comes the stage of red hepatization that lasts for two to four days, then comes the stage of gray hepatization that lasts for four to eight days from the date of infection. Uh, suffering and uh, the fourth stage that is the stage of resolution begins by eighth to ninth day if no chemotherapy is administered and is completed in one to three weeks these are the four stages of pneumonia which is very important Classification of pneumonia on the basis of anatomic part of the lung parenchyma involved. Now, anatomically, I have divided uh, pneumonia into three main types. That is lower pneumonia, consolidation of the entire lobe takes place and generally unilateral. Lower pneumonia is usually unilateral. Uh, in 90% cases, it is caused by pneumococci and seen in middle age group males only. It is the primary infection in a healthy adult. Uh, it is the primary infection, not the secondary one. It is the primary infection in a healthy adult where the onset of symptoms is sudden with high-grade fever, chill and rigor and rusty sputum will be seen in lower pneumonia. Then comes the bronchopneumonia. What is bronchopneumonia? It is uh, what we uh, how we can differentiate from the lower pneumonia. It is identified by the patchy areas. It it don't involve it uh, not involve the entire lobe, but involves in patches, in patchy areas of red and gray consolidation affecting one or more lobes, frequently found bilateral. Lower pneumonia is usually unilateral, but bronchopneumonia is found bilateral and often, more often involving the lower zones of the lungs due to gravitation of the secretions, mainly caused by Staphylococcus, Streptococcus and H influenza and seen in extremes of age groups involving both genders. What we have seen, uh, mainly um, middle age group, lower pneumonia, but bronchopneumonia is uh, usually seen in the extremes of age group, that is either very young or in the old age group. It is the secondary infection in a sick person where the onset of symptoms is insidious with low-grade fever, productive cough, and purulent sputum. And finally, we what we see is interstitial pneumonia caused by mycoplasma pneumonia mainly. It is a rare disorder that affects the tissues that surrounds and separates the TDER sacs of the lungs. These are the three classification of pneumonia based on the anatomic part of the lung parenchyma. Clinical features. 
what we can see by symptoms when a patient comes in our clinic symptoms sudden onset of fever with rigor there will be a continuous uh, continued fever onset of fever uh, with rigor chest pain productive cough with cool and frosty sputum and hemoptysis signs patient looks toxic but conscious decubitus is always propped up respiratory rate high that is tachypnea will be seen but regular and predominantly abdominothoracic type pulse is uh, tachycardia temperature always uh, more than 100 degree fahrenheit inspection on inspection we can see the diminished movement on the affected side of the chest palpation trachea and apex bit in normal position vocal fremitus diminished percussion here we see woody dullness we have seen in the proliferation there is a stony dullness and here is the woody dullness uh, on percussion on auscultation tubular breath sound bronchial and uh, high pitched vocal resonance here increased what we popularly call as whispering pectrology pleural rub is also present pleural rub that is visceral and parietal pleural when uh, the frictional sound what uh, produces uh, what is produced uh, the free due to friction of the parietal and pleural uh, uh, parietal and uh, visceral pleura uh, the pleural drop is also present here what we can uh, do for uh, in case of investigations for pneumonia we can go for a chest x-ray homogeneous opacities over the affected areas cbc uh, esr will be high and uh, wbc count will be high okay uh, sputum test, we can go for a sputum test, then serological test for detecting mycoplasma pneumonia or other viral infections. Okay, restrictive respiratory diseases at a glance. Earlier, I have till now, I have discussed mainly the obstructive part. Now, the respiratory uh, restrictive respiratory diseases at a glance, that is sarcoidosis. What is sarcoidosis? It is a chronic. We get uh, very rare, we get in our clinic, but still we can see these patients also it is a chronic multi-system disorder of unknown cause characterized by accumulation of t lymphocytes and mononuclear phagocytes in various tissues of the body lungs and lymph nodes are mainly involved bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy is the hallmark of the disease both the lungs are involved that is bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy is the hallmark of the disease then comes interstitial lung disease it is characterized by non-infectious diffuse parenchymal involvement of the lungs Kyphoscoliosis, all occupational hazards, all occupational hazards, that is uh, mainly uh, bagasosis, bicinosis, that is cotton, those who works in cotton industry, sugarcane industry, then uh, pneumoconiosis, uh, then silicosis, all sorts of occupational hazards comes under the respective, restrictive respiratory illnesses. General management, what I uh, usually uh, say to the uh, to my patients, general management, inhalation of steam or vapor is must, especially in case of bronchial asthma. Then a person suffering from atopic asthma, that is extrinsic asthma, must not take foods causing allergy and must protect himself from dust, smoke and pollens by wearing masks properly. That is, we must not only wear mask to protect ourselves from covid but as a whole those who are having respiratory sort of respiratory illness and mainly suffering from bronchial asthma bronchiectasis chronic bronchitis whatever must use mask properly whenever you are going outside uh, then the third point a person suffering from copd particularly and even bronchiectasis must abstain from cigarette smoking i usually uh, request my patient though uh, listening and following is their uh, wish but I always uh, say advice to my patient advise my patient to quit smoking so as to protect themselves uh, to abstain themselves from COPD regular freehand exercise is essential at least for 20 to 30 minutes to reduce weight uh, a person suffering from COPD must take enough of fruits and antioxidant foods. 
that is um, pot liver oil and whatever antioxidant foods then green tea you can take green tea whatever foods which are uh, rich in antioxidants uh, patients suffering from COVID must take Myasmatic analysis, I won't go deep in the myasmatic analysis because I don't have too much knowledge in myasmatic analysis. I am giving a synopsis what I realize. If the pathology is reversible and the patient is hypersensitive, it is soda. If the pathology is reversible uh, but with increased secretion and the patient gets relief from the abnormal discharge, it is psychosis. That is mainly bronchial asthma comes in the part of soda, psychosis, psychosoda, this uh, under this miasm. If the pathology is reversible, that is in COPD and all the symptoms uh, are worse at night, then it is syphilis. Extrinsic asthma is sodic, but intrinsic asthma is psychotic. If aggravation, if the uh, patient having the symptoms aggravated in the winter, it is soda. If the aggravation occurs in summer, it is syphilis. And if aggravation in the rainy season and damp climate, it is psychosis. Dry cough is sodic, but productive cough is psychosis or syphilis. Okay, repertorial analysis. I uh, giving this analysis, what I follow the rubrics, what I usually follow the rubrics that I am telling uh, mainly i am uh, dealing from today I, I will be dealing with kent repertory only okay respiration chapter respiration the rubric is uh, asthmatic then respiration rubric is difficult sub rubric ascending respiration difficult cough with respiration difficult dust as from that is uh, in case of um, atopic asthma that is uh, extrinsic asthma respiration difficult exertion after what i have uh, told in dyspnea level one level two that we can uh, see from this rubric difficult exertion after uh, respiration rattling uh, this uh, can be followed in case of uh, bronchiectasis respiration wheezing Cough in the morning, this uh, all uh, comes under the mainly chronic bronchitis, what I follow in chronic bronchitis, cough morning, cough uh, at night, cough uh, then rubric is air, mm, sub rubric is cold, cough asthmatic, cough then uh, bronchial, uh, the similar rubric is also irritation, uh, then cough choking, cough lying, aggravation. The patient uh, the condition aggravates while lying. The, when the patient is saying the symptom is uh, all the symptoms and especially cough aggravates while lying. Uh, this is the main rubric what we can see. Uh, then cough paroxysmal, cough suffocative, cough violent, expectoration. Then the, another chapter expectoration, mourning, uh, expectoration, albuminous, the expectoration is whitish part, expectoration, brick dust color that is rusty, what we uh, see in lower pneumonia and also in bronchiectasis. And the last one here is expectoration copious, that is in profuse amount, if the expectoration, if the frothy sputum is in surplus amount, we can go for this rubric, the chapter expectoration copious. Now, Metria Medica drugs, what I usually deal in my clinical uh, practice, Metria Medica uh, drugs at a glance, some important acute, some important acute drugs, Aconite, Belladonna, Hepersulf, Antimtart, Epica, Rostux, Bryonia, Dalcamara, Eliancipa, Drosera, Rheumex, Pongia, Bromium, Lemna Minor, Sambucus, Aralia Racemosa, Oralia Rubrum, uh, Dediaga, Marxol, Hyosiamus, Ars Iod, Coca, Capsicum, Sinapis Micra, and Coccus Captain. Okay, I will little bit, I will say little bit about all this. Um, aconite, uh, we can go for aconite if sudden uh, dry air, if, uh, if the patient gets worse, if the patient condition gets worse from exposure to sudden dry air, checked perspiration, restless, thirst plus,
uh, fever, there will be a fever scheme dropped. Okay. Deladona, uh, then if the patient do not come in this phase, in this acute phase, if the patient comes after uh, two to three days, we can think then in case of aconite, we can think of belladonna because there will be a throbbing headache, their face will turn red, cyanotic changes. If the patient don't come in the belladonna phase, we can think of then epicup. What, why epicuc? The epicuc here in epicuc, we see the stage of irritation, cough incessant with every breath. There will be a nausea. Uh, and there and here, mainly in the epicuc, the pneumogastric nerve, the pneumogastric nerve is affected. Another one, the pneumogastric nerve affection is antim tart. Antim tart. In, but in antim tart, there will be a stage of relaxation. The mucus all hangs down. But in epicurve, there will be a stage of irritation. There are the mucus plugs all uh, is sticky and it adheres to the walls of the uh, bronchus and uh, tracheobronchial tree. Okay. Antim tart is stage of relaxation. What I have seen, I am telling just uh, then uh, when to give hepersulf suppression of boils, skin disease, abscess. If these are seen and the aggravation part is mainly before morning, the patient is very much chilly from least uh, fresh cold air and amelioration from damp, amelioration from damp weather. The patient is good in case of hepersulf from damp weather. Another two remedies very important in respiratory dealing with respiratory disease where the patient is better from damp weather that is posticum and nux formica then rustux here in rustux the patient is mainly having affections of the fibrous tissue part uh, and aggravation is mainly in the rainy season bryonia serous uh, bryonia affects mainly the serous part, uh, serous part, and uh, serous part, and its affection is mainly to the left side. Aggravation, warmth, morning, amelioration lying on the painful side, uh, and it affects mainly the old age group. Okay, Dalkamara. The, then uh, next drug is Dalkamara. Dalkamara is hot days, but cold nights and damp weather. In Dalkamara, there will be a stocked up nose with profuse coriza, cough, wet weather, free expectoration, and warts on the palms. Then allium sepa, when we can think of allium sepa, acrid nasal discharge, there will be acrid nasal discharge corroding the upper lip, hacking cough on inspiring the cold air, and hoarseness will be there. Uh, in case of sneezing also, we can go for when there will be acute rhinorrhea, coriza, we can think of allium sepa. We can even think of Rs iode, uh, iode also in case of sneezing. But if both Rs iode and allium sepa fails uh, in combating sneezing, uh, in combating um, the sneezing, then we can think of then we can think of synapis nigra. Okay. Then uh, what I am saying, next drug is drosera. When to give drosera? There will be a whooping cuff. Vomiting of the food from coughing worse after midnight. There will be a yellowish expectoration. I have uh, that's why I have told in the expectoration part yellowish. Okay, yellowish expectoration, and there will be dry cough. And the main part in the case of Drosera, all the symptoms aggravated while lying down. Then we can think of rheumex cough caused by tickling in the throat pit. There will be if we place the finger in the throat pit, immediately the patient coughs up. The um, cough caused by tickling in the throat pit covers the head, aggravates aggravation from the cold air, night copious discharge, raw pain under the clavicle. There will be a raw uh, intense pain under the clavicle and there will be a lump sensation, a mucus plug sensation will be there in the throat pit. Okay. In case of acute tracheitis, in case of acute tracheitis, we can think of sticked up pulmonaria. Uh, if it accompanies with burning, rawness, soreness. We can think of causticum also. Okay. Then we can, uh, then when to give spongia? Uh, tubercular diathesis. The patient is lean thin very much. Uh, tubercular diathesis. Swelling of glands will be there. Sore throat. Aggravation from having sweets. Cough, dry, sibilant cough like a saw. Uh, like a saw, the, the wind is passing through the 
woods, through the jungle, through the heavy forest. When through the heavy forest, the wind is passing, the sound is like a sawing. When we uh, use a saw to uh, make furniture, uh, then the, the sound that is produced is what's seen in spongia also on placing our stethoscope. Uh, like a saw, then the wheezing sound will be there. Aggravation is midnight. And in case of spongia, uh, all the symptoms aggravate, ameliorates in the hot weather. The patient is better in the hot weather. When to give bromium? Uh, the larynx and trachea, uh, left-sided mumps, larynx, uh, larynx, trachea mainly affected. Left-sided mumps will be there. Dry spasmodic cough will be there. Chest pain always runs upwards. Amelioration. C, uh, amelioration from the seaside and uh, exercise. The rattle of the rattling of the mucus will be there, but no expectoration, almost similar to antim tart. Cold sensation in the larynx on inspiration, on taking fresh cold air, there will be cold sensation in the larynx. Then we can go for sambucus, what we usually give to the infants, dry coriza of the infants and snuffles. Then we can go for synapis nigra. Uh, synapis nigra nostrils alternately blocked. We usually get patients like this. This nose uh, is open. This nose is blocked. Or um, in the next morning, this nose is uh, open. This nose is blocked. We can think of synapis nigra. Calf ameliorated lying down. Drosera, hyoscyamus. In all these group of remedies, the calf aggravates while lying down. But in synapis, calf ameliorates while lying down. There will be pharyngitis, sweat on the upper lip. In case of synapses, the, there will be sweat on the upper lip. Then we can think of another drug that is mephitis. Mephitis, whooping cough will be there. Mm, whooping cough will be there. The patient is usually... Just a minute. Mephitis, in case of mephitis, whooping cough, patient uh, wants to bath in ice cold water. Very important to note the patient, always, though the patient is having severe respiratory illness, but the patient always desires for to take bath in ice cold water. Food goes the wrong way, few paroxysms during the day, many at night. The cough uh, paroxysms as well as the shortness of breath, the paroxysms of shortness of breath is severe at night. Then we can think of uh, uh, we can think of Aralia. I have all uh, Aralia racemosa usually given in uh, I usually prescribe in mother tincture form Aralia racemosa in case of asthmatic conditions where calf aggravates lying down asthma on lying down at night aggravation mainly 11 p.m. onwards that is at night uh, frequent sneezing will be there hay fever with copious watery excoriate nasal discharge oralia rubrum can also be from the color coriza epistaxis ulceration in the nose very rapid cough in oralium rubrum <coughs> there will be like minute come cough <laughs> like this oralia rubrum Profuse secretion in the morning, barking cough, continuous hysterical cough, as if the patient is hysteric. Throat sensitive to cold air, a little bit of cold air inspired and the cough um, starts. Then we can go for badiaga. When we can go for badiaga, cough aggravates at afternoon, flies out of the mouth. This little bit of mucus plug flies out of the mouth. <clears throat> flies out of the mouth on coughing, uh, thick yellowish expectoration will be there. Then the next drug is Moxol. The patient can't lie on the right side. If the patient can't lie on the left side, then uh, the drug is Lycopodia. Okay. Uh, then continuing with Moxol, cough uh, with yellowish expectoration, the, the, that will be mucopurulent. That will be very uh, feel the smell from the mouth. Two paroxysms. Uh, two, uh, the cough will be in two paroxysms in Marxol, mainly aggravated at night. Okay. Uh, then the next one is Cupramet. Cupramet cold water relieves the main. Uh, Ameliorating point is what the, on drinking, on having cold water, the cough 
uh, relieves uh, there will be vomiting nausea is plus plus very much there will be nauseating tendency suffocating attack of cough uh, at 3 uh, 3 am suffocative attacks of cough at 3 am that is at midnight and always the cough occurs mainly the cough occurs what i have seen also al also given in our bacteria medica books the cough usually occurs in three attacks in three attacks that is in three successive coughs in three attacks also seen these three attacks also seen in stenomet we can also think of uh, we can also think stenomet 2 okay so for your time is, drug... time is over please try to end it okay okay sir okay okay sir. Oh, okay. okay, sir. I want to uh, uh, go and uh, you can also think of this mother tincture also. I have given here. Okay. Uh, what I have dealt about uh, cardiac asthma earlier, cardiac asthma, aspidosperma. Aspidosperma is very important in cardiac asthma along, along with adonis vernalis. Okay. Some important constitutional drugs are also can be thought of. It will be it will be depending on the constitutional type. Three cases are left. Can I discuss? Uh, within Hello? two, three minutes, if, can you complete it? It is already. Uh, uh, sir, I, 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 need, I need five minutes only. Three cases only there. One okay, page okay, each. Okay. Oh, try to make mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Talk. Uh, case number one, I will discuss three cases only. Case number one, this uh, female patient, 15 years age. Shortness of breath was there for last three years, teaching pain on inspiration and sense of heaviness on the left side of the chest was there. Aggravation at night, lying down and in winter. And amelioration was there in sitting erect, bending forward. The patient has tendency to catch cold easily on every change of weather. Uh, she lives in mud house with damp basement. She lives actually uh, in the mud house, uh, very muddy uh, water logging is also there. Father is having rheumatoid arthritis in family history and grandmother having had bronchial asthma. Face is pale yellow, cachectic, sunken skin, dry, desire for fish and sweet. Aversion to tobacco smoke, she can't bear tobacco smoke. Perspiration is profuse and offensive. Stool is soft, muddy, mucoid and offensive. Appetite increased, craves warm food. She always craves her warm food and drinks. Nausea and vomiting just after eating and nausea from smell of food. The patient is a hot patient, uh, anxious about her disease and fear of death. She is just 15 years of uh, age, but she is always worried about her health and she is always worried that she will be dying very soon. I gave, uh, I started with Arsenica Melbourne 0 by 1, 16 doses each I have given till 0 by 4. Then I have given uh, placebo for uh, one month. Then after that, I have taken the case once again. And she was better uh, with lot of symptoms was better at that time that um, aggravation what she used to have the shortness of breath at night was uh, ameliorated ameliorated too then on uh, having the again the case after two months then after a gap of one month and uh, arsenic album zero by one to zero by four after that i gave a gap of one month then I gave Thuja 202 doses were given and now she is doing well. Okay. It's the patient having stopped up nose, one nostril at a time and also running nose from slight change of weather and draft of cold air with breathing difficulty for last eight years. He also having a problem, aggravation, lying on the left side, loud music, sitting still, rainy season and damp weather, amelioration, dry weather, moving about slowly, lives in ground floor, damp basement, a pond just behind the house, nasal polyp in the left nostril, he is having a nasal polyp in the left nostril, sometimes need to breathe through mouth even, headache with dimness of vision after excessive sun heat, Hawking and expectoration, thick yellow mucus often, desire for egg and extra salt. He requires always extra salt while eating. Aversion to food containing gluten and leafy vegetables. He is having gluten sensitive enteropathy. He is suffering from stool, semi solid mucoid, three to four times daily, tenacious present, perspiration profuse, offensive, and white stains in the clothes. Chili patient, sad and melancholy. The case I have given. What I felt is natrum self. 
I have started with uh, 0 by 1 and continued up to 0 by 8. Uh, the patient was doing well also. Later, <clears throat> uh, I gave Soyanam uh, 202 doses only and now he is completely fine. Initially, but initially for the nasal polyp and running nose, what I have told, I gave Sanguinary Nitricum 6 and Lemna Minor 30 were given in minimum dose. The last case and the last slide 2 of my presentation. This patient having breathing difficulty for last 5 years on least exertion and climbing stairs. Mucus plug, always he is having a feeling as if a mucus plug is launched into his throat, into her throat pit, which doesn't come up even after much hawking along with severe rattling of mucus, but with scanty expectoration, aggravation, evening and night while lying. Tendency to catch cold easily on change of weather. The patient is hyperglycemic, always drowsy and sweats profusely on least exertion. He is always drowsy. He don't have as if he, she is she um, don't have any any sort of energy to work. Tongue is coated with a thick white film, thirst normal, desire for cold, refreshing, juicy things, but a tendency of nausea and vomiting is there thereafter. Mucoid stool with severe prostration four, uh, four to five times daily. Lives in a very age-old damp house, ground floor. She stays in the ground floor of a five-story building. Uh, she is ambithermal. On examination, I found crepitations in the base of the right lung, present both on expiration and inspiration. I gave initially antimter 34 doses OD in distilled water. Then after a gap of one month, I gave uh, in one month, I gave placebo. Then after a gap of one month, I gave natrum salt 0 by 1, 16 doses OD given and continued up to natrum salt 0 by 9. The patient was gradually improving, so I continued up to 0 by 9. And now the patient is absolutely fine and doing well. I will only show this spirometry report because I have told earlier several times go for a spirometry PFT. Uh, so this is what the spirometry uh, graph I have uh, given for this last patient. Uh, he, she is having FEV1 by EVC restrictive uh, interpretation is restrictive probably because she is having FEV1 by FVC more than 70%. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Supriya, for your nice presentation. Uh, we are a little bit late, but it is good. Very good. <laughs> We have a very Thank nice topic of knowledge, along with some new information. Dr. Konar, please. Yes. Do Actually, Dr. Supriyo, it is the first subject. Uh, it is yes, the sir, another sir. one. It is the one, My another is the subject. One. It, is, it is the ch chest medicines. It is the respiratory illness. You have taken the subject respiratory illness with homeopathic management, but we have to go. We have to uh, trace about the, our homeopathic part, but uh, so many uh, things you have left. No doubt, Dr. Colony has told you. Uh, yes, you cannot mention the upper respiratory tract and lower respiratory tract also. And uh, both uh, the respiratory illness, you are totally you are discussing about the respiratory illness. So you have to discuss about the upper respiratory uh, tract and also the system and lower res uh, respiratory system also. So it is no doubt it is in this uh, within short time, it is uh, never possible to discuss all those things. But uh, though you have given the medicinal part elaborately discuss, but I have to tell you because uh, frankly, uh, we have to our concern is homeopathic management and no doubt First, you have told before going to discuss that characteristics of the sputum. And no doubt, it is very, very important before going to prescriptions in homeopathy. Characteristics of sputum. Sometimes sputum is sweet, sometimes sputum is sour, sometimes sputum is bitter and salty. And expectation flies from the mouth. You have told the badiaga, but calica, badiaga, chelodinium. So many patients, but you have to compare the medicines and mathematica. Mathematica is the very nice subject, and mathematica either if you 
uh, cannot go to the comparison so he cannot prescribe the single medicines so i have to tell you the before going to prescribe the single medicines uh, you have to characteristic simply take the characteristic symptoms in, in case of acute conditions you must have taken the modality and there you can get but respiratory systems in our very very uh, we can get the very concern the respiratory systems and so many patients will come to us so and you have discussed i basically i told you in mathematica part uh, more stress about this subject and mephitis uh, just i am uh, telling the limited one and mephitis mephitis uh, you are following the re uh, kent repertory and spt if you open the re uh, spt chapter uh, you have uh, you can see there is coughing aggravate more symptoms and breathlessness and then there is only one drug is mephitis and you can see there is only one drug is mephitis very nice drug and somewhere you have discussed in about case but i am also hurriedly speaking and uh, though time is short so first case and second case and third case and someone is uh, you uh, told about the miasmatic diagnosis so there is miasmatic diagnosis sora psychotic and syphilitic and tubercular everywhere is there. so many patients and sora and psychotic and tuber where you can give prescribe the arsenic iodide and arsenic and you have prescribed the arsenic arsenic album the going to be prescribed and each and every condition arsenic album is the weakness and so another characteristic symptoms you must have go so you can uh, differentiate whether it is natansal whether it is thuja whether it is bilis bacillinum or it is uh, arsenic album um, some points should be noted and then you go to the medicines so i may not go to the uh, i will not take the uh, more time but uh, i know that uh, here is our almunia session president he has vast knowledge about medicines uh, i have got relations with 19 Uh, to one i know that he has very vast knowledge about the medicines so i may request the in future the this subject uh, again will discuss and more stress about the homeopathic part and it is the we have uh, we can get the gather knowledge about the in respiratory illness in homeopathy so dr vidut and dr kolani i may request you and the in future uh, you can keep this uh, subject and then we can get the more uh, gather knowledge thank you and thank you thank you dr bindu dr kulan thank you thank and you dr supriya very well please be there yes. thank you sir uh, thank you uh, very nice very nice presentation from both our speakers as per the competition of the cme it's going on though it had been extended uh, anyway uh the first priority will go to shoaib to ask question from any one of the speaker and uh, to both our learned speakers tonight you please check your uh, whatsapp in your whatsapp message the question yes. from the yes, uh, relevant live uh, speakers relevant are live there speakers. so yes. so please answer those questions after shoaib's uh, question shoaib are you there yes sir i am here sir yes sir i am here sir Yeah, thank you, thank you so much, sir, for giving. Thank you so much, sir, for giving this opportunity. Same very helpful, sir, evening, sir. Sir, I am now four questions, sir. Can you explain me? So, uh, previously I uh, previously I asked the are the co-vaccines sir, is safe and effective, and these vaccines is uh, now the government uh, orders and they taken the which will child able to get vaccine. So, so my query is sir, uh, the vaccines are safe and effective or not? Or other hand, sir, will child be able to COVID vaccines? This is my query, sir. Actually, Shoaib, the question should have been pertinent to today's speech. Anyway, uh, Kalyani sir, whom can we put this question to? Sir, Dr. Bidhu, uh, I can tell. Uh, I can tell uh, few yes, words. Sir. Yes, sir. Please. Actually, please. actually, yes, Dr. Shoaib, actually, Dr. Shoaib, you have asked. You know the. You know the. Then it is the our preventing and social medicines that definitely and who, yes, it is the who instruct. the world health organization instructed that is uh, 
definitely you have to go to vaccines all vaccines so it is from the hospital they are taking the uh, vaccines so not only covid i am not telling about the covid vaccines so i have seen so many children are suffering from the respiratory disorders i may i may think dr kolani has so many patients are saying uh, so it is uh, we are seeing day to day practice that uh, so many children are suffering respiratory disorders so it is uh, we cannot say but uh, cannot say that you cannot take it or, or not but it is maybe hazards it is maybe uh, hampered or maybe benefit it is another thing but we have seen and the pvr uh, what they are doing and world health organization what is doing but you must according to instruction of the who and preventive social medicines we have given the instruction thank you dr kolani thank you thank you uh, thank you ashok sir uh, uh yes. yes sir okay shweb no, now i will uh, uh, i'll request uh, dr titankar yes yeah, shweb has said it's yes uh, sir uh, uh, titankar we have four questions to you i had already sent also to ashok sir our moderator's uh, whatsapp and one question for supriyo so titankar yes, you please answer uh, mention the name of the qu uh, question here means of the viewer and also uh, give your answer please sir do i have to give the answer right now here he possible in brief uh, can as give as far as practicable as far as practical and in brief practical 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 approach so sir right. the question here is that sir nowadays rt pcr tests are failing why it is so and what should we do next so my answer here goes as of course rt pcrs detect viral load and a minimum amount of viral uh, viral dna fragments can be detected by re re reverse transcriptase polymer chain reaction if there is a very small amount of even if very small amount of exposure has taken place uh, then uh, then uh, we can still in the pcr mechanism we can still amplify the dna and uh, hence we can detect even with a very small viral load with a very small viral load even we can detect there is if there is a pathology or not if there is a covid is not covid is acting or covid is not first thing is this and the second thing is that whether you are allegating whether you are allegating whether you are allegating that uh, the rt pcr tests are failing i myself haven't even got a single case and biological it's not possible to fail rt pcr tests it may so have happened that there are reporting of the false positives false positives even that case even in that case if you still have a doubt that a patient is having symptoms of covid but the patient is not showing in the rt pcr in that is a very concerning condition that might be due to a significant amount of mutation that might be a condition where you need to notify a consultant virologist you need to notify this condition and even if you cannot find that then you can go for a rapid antigen test however rapid antigen test is much less of a predictive value than rt pcr thank you Next. so so i think all the questions are answered uh, uh, there is another question from monalisa when can we protect others and ourselves if we don't know who is infected we can simply wear masks that's what my answer is we can simply wear masks and we really don't know who is infected because nowadays most of the patients are asymptomatic and with modern day government vaccine drive is going so high that rest assured you will have lots and lots of asymptomatic patients with minimum expected that those patients will be showing minimum transmissibility minimum ability to trans transform transform his or her virus to your body you can take your preventive homeopathic medicine and my, as per my personal view goes that the best preventive homeopathic uh, preventive is the constitutional drug you can take your constitutional drug and you will be likely to have a significant amount of immune response immune protection that is that that is the main point of homeoprophylaxis that is an increased immunity immunity boosting up and immunity can only be boosted up by using a constitutional therapy thank you very much thank you another another question from monal sir no sir i got bodhishatta dasgupta's question no this is i have a question about d dimers what are the yes i have a question about d dimers what are the characteristic features 
that make it a good marker as you said i am not this is not the place where i shall be speaking with you of the chemical structure of d dimers but the d dimers are having a significant amount of uh, clinical importance to diagnose any case where disseminated intravascular coagulation pulmonary thromboembolism any case of hemagglutination or coagulation disorders are suspected two very important tests that we do for coagulation one is d dimers another one is fdp that's fibrin degradation product thank you very much thanks a lot uh, uh, there is one so more question coming question, up question mona lisa vatacharya Com combination right. of globulin infrared and ipeca corona is effective in covid 19 cannot say that about combination drugs uh, even combination is absolutely contraindicated in homeopathy what i personally think is that whether we are prescribing mother tinctures lower dilutions or higher potencies all things mandate use of symptoms Lobelia has a particular symptom of, of swelling, of, of, of salivation with dyspnea, whereas Ipica quena has a clean tongue with dyspnea, has a rails on the chest with dyspnea. But whereas Ipica has rails and crepitations, Lobelia has wheeze and ronca in the chest. So both of them are absolutely different, but yes, they can be used in treatment of COVID-19. Absolutely. What I is think that's... Uh, yeah, please. So swinging pyrexia is just a nice question. That swinging pyrexia is like a pendulum. That a pendulum goes at one side and another one is one side. In 24 hours body chart, if you find that there are two conditions are alternating, like a subthermal temperature in the morning and hyperthermia in the evening, these things are these things are very common with abscess or pass in any part of your body. Even that helped in prescription of calculia sulfurica and sulfur in different conditions of pelvic abscess, COVID, pneumonitis, etc. That's called swinging pyrexia. You can find this in Bodix Botria Medica as well as Clark Dictionary, Clark's Metria Medica. Uh, that's a great uh, QA session from Tithanka. Now over to Shupriyo. Please unmute yourself. You have one question for your uh, session. Shupriyo, please unmute. Sir, uh, is this from my part? One question, how do you... No, 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 no. This is probably from my part. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Over to Titankar. It's one question, how to justify the use of influenzinum and no sweat at the start of a fever? Absolutely correct. Absolutely uh, meaningful question. The use of swords and sarcodes, we have got a list of points of where no swords can be used. I would like to refer... <laughs> And I, I think that Dr. Shant, uh, he, Dr. Mr. Mukherjee is actually a doctor and his question is a very delightful one. We can refer him to study because it's not possible to write now. The introduction part of O. Julian's Metro Medica of the no source by immuno, immunodynamic uh, therapy, the introduction part of it, where Dr. Julian's uh, have given an idea that no source can be specifically, this kind of no source can be used either to remove a block of treatment as well as at the very early stage where to stop the progression of a disease. Uh, and only, I think, one question or just a comment uh, which came, I had just uh, shared with you, Shukriyo, in your, smoking yeah, but smoking is productive. It's for Shukriyo. Smoking is productive uh, for osteoarthritis. It's a high thing, sir. It's a little bit of mockery one. Uh, the smiley is uh, indicating that one only. Okay. Anyway, uh, over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, and there is, uh, we are going to have a brief appeal. Uh, this, it's already been scrolled and given in the description for the benevolent fund and membership of the alumni association. In the beginning, I had told about what our alumnus had uh, done in Tripura. Now, over to you to close the session, uh, our respected Kalyani sir. Over to you, Kalyani sir. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all, especially to our inoculator, Dr. Suraji Sarkar, moderator, Professor Dr. Ashok Konar, our brilliant speakers. Today's speaker, Dr. Tithankar Banerjee and Supriya Dev for giving very important information and I was just telling that it's something of knowledge regarding theory and at the same time some clinical information for records of improvements. It has definitely has encouraged us. So thank you all to the viewers, Vidut, everybody. 
our continuous appeal to all of you that to make this CME successful and crazy. Please inform us, the speakers, and try to propagate this CME to your classmates and senior juniors to make them members and to participate, to come forward with their experiences, to share with us, to improve our homeopathy and to ourselves. This CME is very much effective. I think you all will agree. So please come forward, help us to help you better. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you. Good thank, you. Uh, thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. But uh, we are happy to uh, see that our beloved Dr. Pralay Sharma yeah. is there from yeah, Tripura. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with, with your permission, I would request Pralay yeah, to uh, give his brief uh, feelings and how is he now and how is Jumi. Definitely. Pralay, unmute, please. Pralay, unmute, please. Unmute. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Vidhu. And uh, in fact, I had come for a tour. And uh, on the way, uh, Jumur, uh, your second batch BHMSC got ill. And the entire of this uh, Tripura experience, the way they helped me is a wonderful one. Uh, moreover, the decision, what they took, was a wonderful one for me. And now she is uh, well. And uh, hope that within two to three days, we'll be back to Kolkata. And I would like to thank all the alumni uh, in this platform for helping helping uh, the, each other in their every distress. I believe that will will keep uh, this unity uh, forever. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank, thank you, you all. And uh, good night, as Kalani sir had said. Back to the backstage editor now. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you all. Thanks for watching. If you have enjoyed this CME today, please do make sure to like it and share this to other uh, follow other fellow homeopaths and other persons whom you want to share this with, this knowledge to share with this. And also for our winners with our side at Backstage. So congratulations to him and also Nothing else to say. We'll meet you in our next semi. Until then, good night and join our Telegram channel to get updated. And also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and like our Facebook page. For now, it's me, Orko Mukherjee, peacing out. <laughs>